All right. You have my blessing. Well, thank you, Drew. How no problem. Of you. Ah, uh, well, servant of the people. <laughs> and you. I am a person. You are the big <laughs> homie, Brian Goulet. That's right. All right, good deal. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Zoom out just a hair, just a skosh. And then I'm going to re autofocus myself. Okay. Boom. Get focused, Brian. All right, here we go. Focus. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 36 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we are here to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at Goulet Pens and in our fountain pen lives. And if you will notice, I did all of that without looking at my notes. You did not. I'm so proud of myself. I was like, I'm going to stare into the camera. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it all right. I actually practiced last night because I was like, oh my gosh, 36 episodes in. I should be able to have this intro memorized. I'm not- I am so proud of you. I'm notoriously terrible at memorizing things, you all. That's why I go off script and have such an improvisational, conversational style in the, all, all my videos. Even things where I have written the copy and have said it 35 times again, I still have to practice and like deeply concentrate to memorize one sentence. Anyway. In today's show. That is, so, that is so impressive. I'm so proud of Thank you. You, you said, you, I remember like, you know, episode, like one of the earlier ones, you said, no way. I'll probably never, no way I'm going to remember that. Yes. Yeah. Finally got there. Way to go. Can you I did. do it next week? Probably not. We'll see. Oh, don't worry about it. We know you can now. <laughs> oh, nothing my left gosh. to prove. Yeah, nothing left to prove. Yes. Well, we will because we got to recover from last show because that's, that like it was rough. Drew, oh, Drew and I got something to prove. We were like ashamed at the end of that. We we're like, gosh, we got to do better than this. And we will. Terrible. I promise. In today's show, we're going to be talking about why eyedropper pens, eyedropper filled converted whatever pens, burp, but piston pens don't in general. Uh, why we're leaving money on the table by only selling fountain pens and not ballpoints and rollers and such. What should be your approach when you're choosing a nib on a really high-end pen or like a grail pen? Great question. And we highlight the Edison Beaumont, as well as we have a tip for topping off your piston and vac filling pens and so much more. It's going to be a good one today. I'm feeling it, Drew. I think so. I'm feeling it. I'm excited. It. Got lots of ladybugs joining me today. They're oh, swarming it's a, inside it's the a house warmish, again. It's a yeah. warmish one, yeah. Yeah, Asian lady beetles, technically speaking. they. Uh, Rachel and I were miffed. We don't know where they're coming from. They are just like turning into ghosts and just like coming in through the walls. I can't see mm-hmm. where they're coming from, but I turn away for three minutes and I look back and there's like 20 of them. I'm like, are they coming in through the cracks in the windows? I don't know. Maybe, probably. Anyway, <laughs> we have an every now and Every now and then you'll see one go in the background. <laughs> so keep your eye out for that. It is everywhere. Anyway, uh, let's start off the show with some feedback, shall we? All right, Drew, we've gotten lots of feedback, and uh, you got we some do, to we share. do. Yeah. Um, so both Hills Two Fourteen and Mandy over at YouTube commiserated with me in my mm. disappointment that I shared with you last week about me getting the land, sea, and air combo at McDonald's, thinking mm. I was going to get this obnoxiously just gigantic and horrific sandwich that included three different meats but yes. i didn't they expected me to put it together mm. um so i wasn't alone in that uh mandy uh said that um she also thought that and um you know she also did not assemble them herself i was like no you don't want to open up you know how messy that is and mandy uh mandy's husband i believe was uh super irritated about that as well so um Happy to know I wasn't alone there. Hmm. Even though, in retrospect, it was, it was clearly labeled on the menu that uh, you can just, you have to put them together. Hmm. Um, Jody shared with me that she was at the grocery store and she said, I decided that this toothbrush was coming home with me to be a dedicated pen cleaning brush. And she sent me a picture. It is a little kid's first toothbrush shaped like a giraffe. And the brand name, Dr. Brown's. Oh, wow. How so, perfect is that? So Stephen Brown? Because No, there is another, there is an a, actual Dr. Brown in the 
pen universe, and I am certainly not You're he. You're not him, no. You are. No, definitely rigor, not he. Rigor old Schmo Brown. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, is, is he really a doctor? I mean, the man talks to lobsters and skeletons. He is. Can we, can, can we really trust him? He's not I a mean, medical you, doctor. You know, but he no, has his doctor. Yes, he's got. He's. He's. I don't know. I feel like his sanity is suspect. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, that, the jury, jury's out on that. Yeah. Well, um, it's pot calling the kettle black here, Drew. <laughs> Brown. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, anyway, so that made me laugh. I really appreciated uh, Jody's purchase there. And then uh, let's let's talk about the food a nib in the room here. Uh, Brian and I <laughs> tripped over some words last week as we attempted to. Uh, That's a nice way of putting um, it. Yeah, we, we fumbled a bit uh, in trying to describe what a food a nib was. Um, we, I, I had no idea, apparently. Brian had some idea, but either way, um, thank you for that. Uh, our friend Jamie Grossman over at Hudson Valley Sketches mm-hmm. said this over on YouTube. Food a nibs are amazing for artists. As you mentioned, you can flip it over for a very fine line and get a slightly thicker line with a traditional hold that's slightly more upright. When it's time to add darks to your drawing, you just lower the pen angle, which puts the the broad portion of the nib onto the paper. Most of the Fude nibs I have are a little drier than I'd prefer, but as you said, they can be hard to find, so I can't be too picky. The Pilot Parallel Pens are wonderful for this, too. They yield a fine line for drawing when you turn the pen 90 degrees and use... I've been trying to turn this piece of paper for a while. I'm like, I got plenty of time. No, I don't. Literally ran and out. use the corner when you get those broad strokes for shading or the darker lines. So uh, thank you, Jamie. Appreciate that from someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Yes. Um, ju- just to remind everybody, we definitely do not claim to be experts at fountain pens. <clears throat> we do claim to be people who have worked in a fountain pen store for you know a collective 20 years between the two of us as far as experience goes that, so yeah. that that does provide a, a modicum of experience that could be helpful to some people hmm. but for for sure uh experts uh, we don't we don't throw that word around for sure so uh, no. we do learn something every day and you'll get to see these things being learned uh, if you stick with enough of these pen casts mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, that said, Brian, I did find the Fude Nib pen that we had in the okay. office, and I have been using that for uh, since last week. So um, it's a Jin Hao that we bought somewhere, but uh, the, the nib itself has been quite enjoyable, and I've enjoyed doodling with it and then using the, uh, the curved side mm-hmm. to create a big, thick outline over the doodle, giving it kind of that fun, cartoony stamp appearance. Okay. So I totally see the appeal. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Okay. For drawing purposes, but for like everyday writing, is it a practical pen or is it really? Only, I've, I've actually, I would say if... I was an avid journaler, then using the thick side to do headings uh, would be really helpful to kind okay. of make sure that the outline structure gets nice and bolded. I can definitely see that being helpful. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad that Jamie brought up the point about the pilot parallel because that is also a very popular artist pen. Uh, and it's also one that you can, you know, write with it very, I don't know, wide flat you can get a very thick line out of it but you can turn mm-hmm. it up on edge because it's just two parallel plates it's not curved or ground anything like a normal nib so you can write with basically the edge of it and use it and it's essentially like a fine nib pretty much and that i think the flow is actually pretty good so i think you know for most people that is actually going to be the way to go for just like a, a normal pen that you want that kind of versatility but the food nib is interesting but yeah it's just uh it's kind of obscure that uh, you know, clearly it's uh, something we have more to learn about. So, you know, I think whenever we don't feel like we are the foremost on something, we don't want to shy away from those questions because we do think it's interesting. And sometimes we're able to do research and learn more ourselves and teach you all something. But it, sometimes we don't judge that properly, and we're like, "Yeah, wow, we really needed to know more before answering that." But here we are. We found the line. And, uh... Yeah, a lot of the times our experience <laughs> is heavily dictated from things that come at us in our professional lives. Things mm-hmm. we get asked by customers, uh, products that yeah. we either consider using or do end up using. And food and nibs just have never really kind of penetrated that barrier at yeah. all um, yeah. for, for whatever reason. Uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes we need to we need to stretch out a bit mm-hmm. more in yeah. our and all that all that free time we have. But hey, it prompted you to get up and use that pen, so. <laughs> yeah, at know. least there's that. You never know, you never know. Um, there was a time when literally every topic, we were just as ignorant and had to learn and, you know. Yeah, why change now? Yeah, exactly, right? 
Um, okay, I got some feedback too. Uh, lots of congrats on the Sailor Bespoke status. So thank you everybody for that. It's pretty cool. We're very honored. Um, Becky said, congrats on being a B Sailor Bespoke seller. Hearing all these prices made me think, what enabled you two to brave the price of some of these high-end pens for the very first time? Hearing something above $1,000 is very, very, very daunting. I get that. It's definitely not a territory that everybody goes to or needs to go to or wants to go to you know it's like part of the the whole thing with fountain pens ever since we got into it was like we wanted it to be accessible and enjoyable for pretty much everybody now there's a huge range of prices and options and stuff with fountain pens in general and i think given you know especially the reputation fountain pens have had and like the 80s and 90s really as like status symbols and stuff like that some of that still kind of carries true where people think they're like very elite kind of products it's definitely not always the case though but it can be so i think there's an intimidation factor these really expensive things which i get so the thing i will say about these like bespoke kind of high-end pens and stuff like that you know there's not a lot of them for one we're not like personally like buying one of these things like we're as a company buying them and then selling them to those who are interested in. So for us, the decision to buy these high-end pens like as a company is really a matter of, are these pens that other people will want to buy? So it's very different than making a personal purchase decisions. So I don't know, with me personally, it's still a very intentional you know, decision to spend that much on a pen for my personal collection. Uh, but even still, it's, skewed a little bit because we're in the industry and we you know get to use these pens and show them to you all so there's a justification there for like oh like kind of marketing and promotional use and like these types of things um just for collection sake and having them for posterity and stuff like that so that's how i get to justify many of the purchases i make but even still like anything in that price range it's it's always an intentional decision that i have to approve through my um financial advisor slash rachel so <laughs> yeah yeah and from from like a retail perspective it was super challenging when we first uh, were getting started choose like saying okay let's try to sell this thousand dollar pen i remember when i started brian i believe you and rachel already had two platinum pens mm -hmm. that were like celluloid pens one of them was faceted mm -hmm. and the other one was kind of sparkly and those yeah. were like up on the shelf there was just one each mm. and it was like there they are like hey don't you know don't mess with those those are the oh, yeah. the thousand dollar pens and i was like i remember when we sold one it was like oh my god because it's, it's especially when you're starting out that that's just money sitting there and oh, yeah. you know obviously as you get a little bit more confident in the fact that these will sell it becomes a little bit different but it, it's still like we pay close attention to when we decide to say yes to expensive pens for sure yeah Absolutely. But, you know, with something like this, it's such a, you know, to, to be able to offer something as a as bespoke seller, it's 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 pretty elite to to be able to do that as a as a retailer. So it's pretty much like, well, yeah, like there's so few of these things. They're so high quality and so unique. It's kind of a no brainer. If we're given the option to carry it, we will definitely yeah. carry it. So that actually made it pretty easy. Um, and then Jessica says, you know what, guys, I think part of your podcast being so fun for so many of us is that it's time to just relax and feel like you're part of a conversation that's interesting and fun and not about the hard things going on in the world and the inevitable anger that usually comes about from disgusting stud issues. We all need that safe space to relax and recharge. And thank you for helping provide that. Well, that's really cool, Jessica. Thank you. We try to disclaim at the start of this pen cast that it's going to be, you know, not a super serious thing. We try to be correct in our information, but it's meant to be lighthearted and fun. And, you know, even just for us putting it together and, and delivering it to you all, like we enjoy doing it because it's fun and, and we like it and we love the engagement and stuff like that. So I'm glad that that's felt all around. You know, that said, there's some crazy junk going on in the world. And that's really tough sometimes. And, you know, we're dealing with COVID stuff still and the whole Russian-Ukraine conflict is uh, definitely heavy on our minds right now. But that said, that is pretty much everywhere in the news right now. We are paying attention to all that stuff. And I think it is a benefit that we can provide to offer some reprieve from some of the harder, more serious things in the world. And we're glad to be able to offer that to you all. So. 
whenever there's crazy stuff going on in the world, it's not that we're trying to ignore it. Absolutely, we care deeply about these very important issues, but we're trying to make this, you know, a cool, fun, safe pen place. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So it's really cool to hear that. So uh, that said, that's what we got for feedback this week. And now we're gonna move on to some new stuff. Something that I have that's kind of new, kind of not. We have the Sailor Cocktail. These are the Pro Gear Cocktail Pens. We've had them as the set. And I mentioned that we're gonna start out with the set. We may end up breaking them up, but they're not you like- did. They're not like packaged. You it. Yeah, I did. They're not like packaged together necessarily with like SKUs and barcodes and stuff to be individual products. So it's a little extra work to do that, but you know what? We had enough interest in it and we said, what the heck, we'll try it. So. We started doing that. Um, so we have the five colors around the world, Violet Fizz, Blue Train, Argentina, and Gin Martini, all as individual pens now. I will say there are three different nib sizes on these pens with five colors, plus the full set, plus the case, I guess, because there's a pen case that comes with the full set. So we sell the case separately when we break up the pens. So it's a total of 17 different products, actually, once we break it all out, instead of three, if we just carried the sets. So it's kind of a whole thing. No, not 17. There would be three nib sizes for the sets as well. Anyway, 15 plus three, 18, 19. 19 different SKUs, different products. So it's a lot. And then, you know, that just really splits up the the um, actual like count of products that we have. So anyway, you'll see some stuff's out of stock and whatnot and whatever, and it gets really confusing, but uh, you know, we just decided, okay, what the heck? We'll give people more options. It'll be a little more confusing on our end, but you know, then people will like it and they'll be able to get the individual things. So glad to do that for you. But anyway, we now have the individual Pro Gear cocktail pens for $312. The pen case is $79 if you want. It's a five pen case. It's fine. It's a black case. It's fine. It's nice. It's a sailor on it. It's cool. Um, and then uh, regarding the comments about the Sailor Bespoke, um, I mentioned last week how we're going to talk about these pens and they'll probably not be around very long. Well, the Ryokyo sold out basically immediately and they were not available by the time that we actually published a pen cast. So go figure. And then, um, you know, the other ones that we have are also selling out quickly. So, um, you know, this is how it's going to be with Bespoke, um, but we are going to have some more that we know are coming down the pike. We can't talk about them yet, but there will be more coming. And uh, yeah, we're very excited about the options that are going to be coming available. So stay tuned and pay attention to the Sailor page on our site. And uh, I got one more thing, Drew. This isn't really a new product, but you know, we had some discussion around the Girologia writing mats, and I thought it was at least worth just kind of mentioning them. And I yeah. know that people can't see things unless I hold it up like in front of my face. There you go. Mm -hmm. So these are the writing mats. They We had some confusion about how they were actually made because we knew that they were leather to a degree, but then we had some people asking like, is it really leather? Because it doesn't feel the same as leather and all that kind of stuff. So we got some clarity around the actual process for making this. And I apologize for not clarifying that at the onset. This is a newer product and, you know, Girologio behind the scenes has had some, you know, operational things, some challenges they've had going on. So, you know, it was difficult to get some of that information up front, but um, it was kind of cool because we were able to learn better about the process for making these specifically. So it's, uh, it is real leather and it's uh, made of, they call it reconstituted or recycled leather. So it's basically, mm -hmm. they take leather scraps and things that would otherwise basically just be thrown away. They grind them up into a pulp and then they mix it into, you know, with some kind of binder or resin or something like that. I don't know all the exact details. They press it into these mats and have like a foam backing on it. So it's got a really good grip to it. Um, and it's very smooth, but it's got a lot of the great properties that leather would have, the durability and stuff like that. So it's actually a very eco-friendly process because they're using waste products to create it basically, but it's still getting a lot of benefits of real leather and it's less expensive. So we were able to get some clarity on that. It's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I got renewed vigor for that. Um, we have had, you know, they've been pretty popular, so we haven't had the best of <laughs> in stock uh, of those, but you know, we're gonna keep carrying them ongoing and stuff like that. And I think we're looking at some some you know full grain leather versions of them as well. They're going to be a little more expensive in a couple different colors, but uh, yeah, they've been pretty popular. So anyway, just in case anybody was confused, we were confused a little bit about it, and uh, you know we were able to get clarity on it though. It's full leather, but it's just this re this reconstituted leather, which is I wasn't really even aware that that was a, a thing. But as soon as they explained to us what it was, I was like, oh, that makes sense, and that's actually really cool. So anyway, glad to see that. Yeah, that is pretty cool. I yeah. like that. Yeah. 
Um, I have previously mentioned some of the upcoming Caveco stuff. The iridescent pearl Caveco Sport has been super popular. It's lovely. I'm happy to report that I saw one the other day in the office and it looks just as pretty as the stock photos. We'll have our own photos done, but it looks very, very beautiful. And I think it's going to go hot. So ignore what I'm saying because it's probably going to disappear before you get a chance to get it. Um, but hopefully not. Either way, sign up to, for the back in stock notifications if you want to be alerted, and you will be. The Lilliput from Caveco as well is getting a third edition, right? This is going to be the third type of Lilliput you can get, I believe so. Sounds about right. Yes, it is, of course. Um, and then, uh, but it's also, Brian just told me this, the lightest weight pen we currently sell yeah. now. So mm -hmm. it is, it's aluminum instead of the brass and fire blue models, which have some heft to them, you know, relative to their size, of course. Mm -hmm. And this one just feels like nothing. It's so tiny, so light. Nine grams. If, Nine grams. If you are, like Brian has said before about the Traveler's brass pen, that it can get like lost in your pocket it's so unnoticeable yeah this pen like you literally will not know it's there like oh, it's like the the lily put uh fire blue that i have is the only pen ever in the 12 plus years i've been doing this that i've actually put through the wash mm. partly because it doesn't have a clip so you know i had it in my pocket but it was just down in there it just goes down and then yeah. when i was patting it down i just didn't you know it's so small i just didn't feel it and it actually went through the wash and it kind of kind of stinks because it, it took away some of the vibrancy of the vi the, the fire yeah. blue which makes sense but it's like dang it why did i just put that yeah. pen not through? a good one to wash so yeah so, so don't do it's, that. it's a beautiful pen though so if the lilliput has mm. been one on your radar but the other two types have been a little cost restrictive for you this is the one to pick up and it's also very very pretty however mm. brian Mm -hmm. Of the three new Caveco things we have coming down the pipeline, mm -hmm. those two pens I don't even care about because Caveco is coming out with the, uh, oh gosh, I just wrote twisty thing. It's called the, twi twi uh, the twist and twisting, out. Twisting out. The twisting out. Okay, this thing, I was playing with this today. It is a ink cartridge holder dispenser. So you can put a bunch of cartridges in there twist 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 to kind of feed it through um it can hold a bunch of cartridge it, cartridges in this fun little dispenser and then you twist the bottom of it and it pops one out like literally pop right on out and i love that because while bottled ink is obviously better and more fun and gives you more options i just like the fact that cartridges are getting some love in the whole accessory department because if you did want to carry a bunch of cartridges with you how are you going to do it? Like, there's the, um, you mm -hmm. know, Private Reserve uh, and Monteverde have these little kind of um, jewel case things. And they have this... They're good. They're, they're good, but they have this little thing in there where they all fit together. And they're so you have to like, keep them lined up and everything. And mm -hmm. this is way easier to use. It's just, it's made for carrying cartridges and for putting them in. I yeah. love it to pieces. And I'm super stoked about it. I'm definitely going to get one. So yeah, I mean it's a fiddler's delight. It's like a little yeah. toy that you can just mess with, and Absolutely. you know it's not it's it's not like it's some like offbeat proprietary you know cartridge. Like the it, I don't I don't know that it's going to fit any other brands cartridges in there. Probably not, but it'll fit the standard international. So yeah, it, yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be Quaker, you know, but it'll fit any in which that's the most universal one that's that's around there. So, you know, it'll fit plenty of different cartridges. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm glad to see yeah, it. When I, when, I, when I get mine, I didn't want to do this with the one they were taking pictures of in photography, but when I get mine, I'm going to like just see, I'm going to just crank the heck out of it and see how many I can eject how fast. Mm, okay. Maybe I'll do it next pen cast. Yeah. I got to get, get my hands on one. There you go. Um, and then sometimes I have spoken about the paper brand Maruman Namasani. It's one of my favorites. I think they have some really, really great sizes and formats. Uh, big fan of the top spiral bound. We got a restock on those. They've been out for a while and mm -hmm. now they are back. So if you wanted one of these fun little, oh uh, uh, yeah, like this little doodad, look at him. That's a little nothing notebook. Little steno pad. That's a little nothing, <laughs> but it's. I love this one because it's so perfect for just keeping in your pocket, writing down things you just want to get in your brains, and then just toss them when you're done with it. You don't really need to reference it, but it's a good memory thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mnemosyne, right? That's it's a whole memory that, memory thing. Is that what that means? Yeah, 
Yeah, she's like the uh, a, a memory. I believe she's a memory muse. Oh, I see. What? Oh gosh, that was bad. I didn't. Yeah, that was real I bad. Didn't, I didn't really have a lot of confidence behind that one. Anyway, go uh, ahead. Oh yeah. Anyway, all right. <laughs> just finishing things off. Um, we are looking at a brand, an ink brand called Ferris Wheel Press. You might have heard of it. It's a pretty popular brand overall. Ink they've and been pen around. Brand. They've been they around. Too. Yeah. They do have pens. You're right. They do have pens. I think they're primarily no, no known for ink. ink. Yeah. Definitely primary known for ink. So um, we're looking at them. Um, they have been around for a while, uh, you know, fairly popular, especially for a brand that we don't carry. Um, but it's kind of, we don't even know where to begin, do we, Brian? Uh, they've got a lot of colors, at least 45 that we know of. It's a lot. And we'd, we'd like to know if you've used that brand or if you have any favorite colors. Um, very curious about that. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Brian? Um, yeah, I mean, we had looked into them. We were in conversation with them like a couple months before the pandemic started to really go down. Um, and we were looking at, at that time, they didn't have the size bottles that we're looking at now. They only had like the really big, like globe shaped ones. And they're they're mm -hmm. definitely like those ones, especially were very premium priced. So we always found it appealing, but just never, you know, got the traction on actually making it happen. And then the whole pandemic thing happened. So yeah, we're, we're very interested to hear what y'all's feedback is. If you have any experience with it, um, please let us know in the comments. I mean, we're we, we're liking what we see so far, but you know, we test a lot of different products, and we always like to be thorough. You know, it's a lot of work for us to carry a new brand, just getting to know it. You know, doing photography and product listing and descriptions, all that type of stuff. So we like to be intentional about it. So you know, this is one that we're more seriously looking into, and uh, you know, we'd be curious to know what y'all think. So there you go. All right, that's thank it. you. That's plenty of new stuff. There will be more coming. I'll say we are, whew, we have more new stuff coming down the pike than we know what to do with. So be on the lookout for that in the coming weeks. Um, but until then, we have Q&A to get to. Okay, Brian, you ready for question number one? I hope so. Because I am ready to say Last it. week's number one was about the food a -nib, so I'm going to like, ooh, I got to recover a little bit. I know. Um, we've got some long form, long form questions this time. Most of these from email, which uh, you can do if you would like to uh, send an email to um, pencast at goulaypens.com. This is where these come from. Um, John asks us, do you feel that you're missing out on profit potential by concentrating mainly on selling fountain pens? Visconti, Aurora, Pelican, and many of the manufacturers you sell off also offer nice ballpoint and rollerball versions of their fountain pens. I still use my ballpoints. Sometimes it's more convenient to just use a zero maintenance pen for writing checks and addressing envelopes, etc. What say you, Goulet? Yeah, good question. You know, this is, <laughs> believe it or not, we get asked this a lot from the suppliers who are providing us fountain pens because they're like, well, y'all are really good at selling fountain pens. Why don't you try other things that we also are happy to sell to you? And we're like, well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? But the crazy thing is we're really known for fountain pens and that's pretty much what people come to us for. Um, we have very much of a kind of like conversion story experience that we're kind of known for ourselves as well as the people that come to us are a lot of new people who've never used fountain pens and once they do they kind of don't want to go back necessarily no that's not everybody of course um but you know it just it, we, we don't get as much demand for non-fountain pen things even from the brands and models we already carry as you might think um so you know we, this was a few years ago probably let's see your 2014, 15 timeframe, I want to say, we were like, you know what? We're going to lean into some pencils and roller balls and just try them out with some of the most popular models that we have, you know, the Pilot Metropolitan, the Lamy Safari, Twisby pencil, you know, et cetera. And uh, we carried some, you know, and we sold some with like some of the limited edition you know, things that would come out or special editions for that year or whatever. We tried carrying like Pilot G2s, which is the most popular rollerball in the US. So you would think that we would be able to sell some, even just by accident, you know, but uh, we didn't really. They actually kind of flopped. In fact, it's kind of a little inside joke with us and Pilot USA that we are the only retailer to have ever returned Pilot G2s because we couldn't sell them which is kind of funny, but also sad, but also not, I don't know. So, you know, the thing is, 
I think that you know pretty much every other re- every other fountain pen retailer that I know of, they carry a lot of different modes. You know, they may they may focus a little more on fountain pens, but they'll offer ballpoints and things like that, or sets, you know, whatever that come out. Totally makes sense, and I think especially if they have a brick and mortar presence, that makes a lot of sense because a lot of people just kind of walking into a pen store in general, you know, they would be walking in expecting ballpoints and pencils and things like that. Um, but us, because we're only online. We only sell in our store. We don't sell on places like Amazon and stuff like that. Pretty much anybody that comes to our store, they know why they're there and what they're trying to get. So, you know, we just we're we're known for that. We have a niche, and you know, it, it's uh, not as much demand for the the stuff outside of that as you would maybe think. Um, and then just internally for us, we already have, you know, five thousand or so different products, SKUs, you know, different modes and you know, you know, nib sizes and ink colors and all this type of stuff. It's a lot for us to keep track of, even just with our current offering. So really for us to stay as focused and as knowledgeable as we are, we need to keep that focus fairly narrow. So we have kind of from the beginning been a little more the mentality of we're going to keep a narrow focus and just make sure that we're doing it as absolutely, you know, just premium as we can in terms of service, experience, knowledgeability, presentation, all that stuff. Um, if we were to spread out into other things, which we did experience that when we got into other types of planners and sketchbooks and, you know, more artist materials, we've carried some various brush pens, we've carried, you know, other things. As soon as we step outside of fountain pens, it's like, oh my gosh, we, we just are at such a disadvantage because we don't know any of that stuff as well as we know fountain pens, but people still want us to know that stuff equally as well. So we're like, yeah, we just can't really we can't really be that for those modes. So, you know, for us, it's been able to give us a focus. We're just try to be the best that we can possibly be in the fountain pen situation. And we do that by staying narrow. So I would say, yeah, we're absolutely leaving opportunity on the table, but that's where our mission statement really helps. Um, you know, kind of the one exception, if you look on our site, we do carry retro 51, you know, roller balls. But, you know, our mission statement is, uh, you know, geared around fountain pen enthusiasts. And it's evident to us that fountain pen enthusiasts are also enthusiasts for specifically Retro 51 rollerballs. So we even had a lot of conversation about carrying those when we first started out. A lot. And we don't carry everything. We carry just the things that fountain pen people are really into. So that's really what drives a lot of it is uh, keeping that expertise, keeping that focus and uh, making sure that we're offering things that the fountain pen enthusiasts uh, really love the most. And we let you all help to guide us in that way. So um, I would also like to add that since we did start carrying Retro 51, there has not been an upswell of interest in ballpoint pen, uh, rollerball pens. No. Like we, th- we thought like, all right, well then are they going to want more? No, the answer is no. We have not had yeah. a lot of requests for more rollerballs. It, the Retro you know, Target seems to be the thing that fountain pen enthusiasts, you know, mm-hmm. kind of tangentially enjoy. And uh, Brian mentioning our values and mission statement. Uh, we talk about values and mission statement a lot here. It's not just kind of like, you know, lip service, you know, plastered on a wall. Um, it, it They do act as very tangible guiding principles for ours. And it's, it's, you know, when you have a good set of values, it makes, you know, decisions, you know, much easier and much more, you know, unifying. One of our uh, values is empower through education. And that, you know, goes to what Brian was saying about how we want to do things that we can educate on. Not food a nibs, obviously, but um, we we don't carry food a nibs. Notice we so, don't sell them. If we sold them, right, we would exactly. know a lot more about them. <laughs> exactly. We don't want to sell anything that we can't educate on, or at least l- provide that you know high level of support that we've become known for. We w- we want to continue to be known for. Yeah. Well said. Well said. And a little inside baseball here, um, going back to some of those earliest company meetings that we had. There's a little inside joke with me and Drew um, talking about like carrying products and, and keeping our niche narrow and stuff like that. We have kind of an inside joke that I was just, I was in a company meeting and somebody was bringing up something around that. And I was like, no, we're not selling trampolines and water balloons here, guys. Like we're selling fountain pens, you know? And so I just like threw that out randomly. And so we bring that up from time to time. Uh, really, this is a way like, yes, theoretically we could sell anything. Like we're a retailer. There's no reason we have to stick in this niche. We could sell, you know, anything we want. We could sell diapers and uh, I don't know, lollipops and chair cushions. Giraffe toothbrushes. Giraffe toothbrushes and chair cushions, you know, and that's certainly within a retailer's 
purview, but you know, we like to stay narrow by our own choice and by you know that of the community we serve. So there you go. We've if we do start selling yeah. trampolines and water and balloons, you know we're in trouble. You know we've jumped the shark. Yeah, absolutely. You should watch out. That's when you know we're getting too bored. Um, but we're not bored yet. It's been twelve plus years. All right, moving on to the next question. This one is from Mark, and Mark asks: Most of us have a preferred nib size. I used to prefer fine nibs, but have gravitated more towards medium and sometimes broad in recent years. That's known to happen, Mark. I totally get that. I find myself more willing to experiment with nib sizes on less expensive everyday carry pens. How do you decide what nib size to get when making a more substantial pen investment? Do you always stick with what you prefer or do you experiment with nib sizes in more expensive pens as well? This was a great question. I don't know that I've yeah. ever specifically been asked this before. So this is this all fresh for me, Drew. So I'm very curious. I, li I like this one. And, yeah. and I actually agree with Mark on some of this. If, um, if I'm paying a lot for a pen, that definitely plays into how choosy I am with my nibs. Otherwise, I just, I actually try to keep a pretty good variety. If it's like a Twisby or something like that, I'll just say, what haven't I bought in a while? And mm. if I'm feeling like my, my broads have, are a little you know, unevenly balanced in my variety, then, oh yeah, I'll pick up a broad. I haven't done that in a while. So I'll just do that casually. Um, but if I'm spending, you know, hundreds of dollars, then I definitely get more choosy. I find that if I'm buying a Japanese pen, I almost always go with an extra fine. Because in my mind, when you pay for a Japanese extra fine, it's almost like you're, you're getting more for your money because I know, and Brian, you know how mm -hmm. hard it is to grind an extra fine that writes perfectly well. Oh, it's yeah. more work. It's absolutely more work. Even an, an ultra extra fine, double extra fine, oh my God, we've both tried to do those and it is hard. Yeah. So in my mind, like knowing that, knowing how hard it is to create an ultra extra fine line and have it feel good and write well, I'm like, I feel like I'm kind of like gaming the system. Like I got this for the same price as that broad would have been. So I'm definitely extra fine all the way if it's a Japanese nib. Anything from Sailor, Pilot, extra fine every time. Fine as I can get, 100%. Mm. I have a Platinum Ultra extra fine, love it. Oh my God, yeah, give them to me, all the, all the fines. If I'm going with a European pen, an Italian, German pen, then I gravitate more towards mediums and broads. I think that, um, they are nice and juicy. The uh, you know uh, the Lamy 2000s, the Pelicans, all of those like they can put down a ton of ink, and that's a lot of fun. And I like mm. to have every now and then a sort of handwriting that masks any imperfections. And when you have a medium or broad, um, even a little hand wobble here and there gets a little disguised because you're just putting down a crap ton of ink. So I find that's fun hmm. as well. So I really do I like to kind of gravitate towards like, what does this type of brand do really well? Hmm. And, you know, take that in, in, into consideration. But generally speaking, I'm not super picky. I, I can write with anything and enjoy it. So going back to kind of the nature of the first part of the question, like, do you, are you, are you less adventurous, I'll call it, with a more substantial investment? Like, would you, would you? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say so. You play a little safer when there's more money on the table. It makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially if it's a nib that I can't easily replace. Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah, if, if it's like, a, you know, if it's like, if it happens to be a 300 some dollar, you know, handmade pen that does have a Yovo nib, then I won't really care because I know mm. I can find that. But if it's a, an artisan pen handmade in the US somewhere, those are around and they're, they, they can, hang out in that $300, $400 range. But if they've got a Yovo nib, then yeah, I don't care, whatever. Whatever they have in stock. If you see them in a Pencho or something like that, what, what what nib does that have on it? Oh, medium, all right, sure, fine. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I'm kind of in the same boat. I've, I mean, I'm, I'm probably very much an outlier answering a question like this because I have more than any reasonable amount of pens that anyone should approach having. Um, yes partly by choice and partly by just the nature of what I do. Um, that said, I, in my earliest days, when I didn't have as much experience and I was buying, you know, like my first Pelican M800, they were coming out with a 1.5 millimeter stub. I'd never used one. It was a pretty, that was the most expensive pen that I bought at that time. I'd never used that nib. I bought it and it performed differently than what I thought. And I was disappointed with that nib for a little while. 
had some, you know, not to disparage it or anything like that, but it was just different than what I was expecting. So definitely I felt the burn of making a more speculative purchase on a pen that was in that Holy Grail kind of territory. And I was, you know, having to deal with the, the, the consequences of that. Um, so, you know, I totally understand the whole playing it safe kind of mentality. So um, I think for me, generally speaking these days, you know, I have, I have a unique perspective because I mean, if you look at our nib nook tool, literally every nib that we carry, I have written with. So I have experience with every brand, every model, every nib size that we've ever carried. So, you know, granted I can't go into super detail about all the intricacies and differences between every single one of those, but I have enough experience where I pretty much know what I like and I know what I'm gonna want when I'm going to pick out a pen. So I'm in a unique spot there. But even with that in mind, um, I'm a little bit like Drew. I will tend to go more with what I know that I like on a more expensive pen because I know that I'm going to want to take care of it and use it and just make sure that I am going to really enjoy it. Um, that said, you don't always get that choice because sometimes when you get more expensive pens, you might, or like limited editions and things like that, it might only come in medium or fine or something like that. And if you love double broad obliques, well, you're not going to get that as an option on most pens. So some of that you might have to be a little bit flexible. So I tend to gravitate towards either like fines or broads on some of these pens where there are more limited options um, when you're talking about expensive pens. Um, now, when you're talking, I mean, really, I would consider like gold nib pens and on up, you know, that's pretty much what we're talking about in these in these uh, more expensive pens. Um, for me, I will actually kind of do a little bit what Drew says, where I will look at the individual manufacturer or the pen model, and I'll say, what's unique here? You know, like most of my personal sailor pens are zoom nibs and medium fines, because you can't get those on other brands. So I like to have that experience, and I think they're cool and interesting. But of course, I have a large pen collection that I can choose other nib sizes if I want to write with something. If my options were more limited, I'd probably play it a little more safe. Um, but I like Drew, it's like platinum. They've had like one pen that's had ultra extra fine. Well, I've got that, you know. I have the soft fine and the 3776 on certain limited editions. And I will almost always gravitate, just because I like to have a breadth of experience, I'll almost always gravitate towards what is unique and kind of, you know, special to that brand or that model first, even if it's not the nib size that I personally prefer to use, because I want to have that experience and then be able to draw upon that as we talk about things in videos like this, um, whether or not I'm personally going to use that pen a lot in my daily writing. Um, Let me ask you a question, though. You mentioned getting so many Zoom nibs. Do you actually subjectively enjoy writing with those more than any other Sailor nib? Um... I don't know. I don't know if I would say that necessarily. Because I don't. I think they're fun, but I, I don't I don't want to own one. Well, fair enough. And they're not for everybody. So I wouldn't but, say but, that. But, that's but if you, you but if you go. but if you were to if if you had a bunch of sailors and they were all the same pen and you're like, all right, which one am I gonna write today? Would you grab the zoom? Um, it depends what I'm trying to do. It depends what I'm trying oh, to do okay. with it. Yeah. I mean again, I'm in kind of a unique spot because I'm almost always have the luxury of using a pen for the sake of gaining experience and knowledge of that pen for this type of purpose or okay free for let, you know, let's say you're just writing for your content own pleasure. or something let's let's you're writing for pleasure just yeah. to relax you've got sunbeams coming through the windows you've got a, yeah. a cup of tea and you're just gonna say you know what i want to write just for fun what yeah. nib what sailor nib are you gonna go with you know i i will probably bounce around a little bit yeah i would i would pick up a zoom nib just as quickly yeah. as i would pick up and, okay, and extra cool. fine or whatever. Well, you are a true nib chameleon, my friend. I am a bit of a nib chameleon. Yeah, I do like to use a lot of different things, especially because there's so many different nib brands and other things out there. I like to cycle through them all because there might be certain nib types, like a platinum music nib. Like when's the last time I wrote with a platinum music nib? It's been a while. So next time I'm looking at my pens and I'm like, oh, the music nib, I haven't used that in a while. Let me pick that up and use it again. So that's more my motivating factor, but you know, I am I am that person who, when I get into a hobby or something like that, I like to get as many different versions of whatever the thing is so that I get a perspective on the whole offering. And then over time, I'll hone in on some of my favorites, like my actual 
favorite nib to write with in Sailor is probably a broad, actually. Like mm. the King of Pens broad is my favorite um, because it's a little bouncier and it's, you know, it's broad, but it's actually not massive. It's not as broad as like a Pelican broad, you know, but I like that. Um, but, you know, if that was the only pen that I use, it might be a little too too broad. So I might go towards a medium fine if I had no choice about the paper type. So I, I don't know. I, I take a lot into account when I'm, I'm picking a pen. Uh, that sounds use. like you. Yeah. But that said, I do have some preferences. I usually get, um, like I said, the, the medium vines or the zooms on the sailors because they're unique and they're great nibs. Um, I like the soft nibs on the platinums because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the stiffest of nibs. Um, so I like their soft nibs the best. I'll always get that if I can. Um, Pilot, I love their medium nibs. They're just great. Um, Pelican broads are fantastic. Lamy 2000, I love the fine. Viscani fine's my favorite. So for me, I, I do bounce around quite a bit depending on the brand, but I would say if I was to actually like statistically look at which nibs I'm picking, I probably have my preferences that are somewhere in that fine, medium, broad range. Fine, medium, broad range. range? Yeah. Somewhere in that range. I guess that's, <laughs> I guess that's kind of a spectrum, isn't it? It really it definitely depends. Is. It really depends. <laughs> Really Somewhere depends. in the fine to broad range. Yeah, classic Brian non-committal kind of answer <laughs> yeah, Seriously, here. but I will give it. Okay. More, I will give it more thought on a more expensive pen. I, yeah, if I, yeah, I, I, I definitely will. Awesome. Well, I think we're we're good on that question. All right. I'm not sure we okay, actually let's answered any of it, but go ahead. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I, I think we did. We did. Um, and then uh, Shazina asks us both, "Hey, Brian and Drew, I had a question for the pencast that's been bugging me for a while." Oh boy. Mm. Okay. I know that when pens are eyedroppered, they are at risk of burping when the ink level gets too low. I have a Pilot Plumix that I eyedroppered after using some glue at the bottom, and it's about a third of the way full, and it burps almost every word. In other words, unusable. That's a lot of burping. However, a piston-filled pen like the Twisby Eco has mm -hmm. ink sloshing around in the barrel and doesn't burp at all, which is why I bought five of them. Why is it that burping doesn't happen with a piston filler, but it does happen with an eyedropper converted pen? Mm. Wouldn't the same the same principles of air warming up and expanding also apply to piston fillers? It blows my mind. Thanks in advance. Mm. Well, thank you, Shazina, because Brian is going to say some things. Drew did ask me about this question before yes. you put it in here. Yes. He's like, so I got this question. How confident do you feel in being able to answer this? I'm not going to say he was questioning me <laughs> no, on it. After, but I think after it was, the food day question, I'm like, I don't want to. He didn't want to trip me up with something. No, I didn't want to do another food day. <laughs> I want. I wanted to know like one of us needs to be able to answer this because I, I told him I was like, because I don't know. I have no idea. Like I'm just as confused as Shazina is yeah. here because I'm like, why? Why aren't the air ink interchange? principles the same yeah there's a reservoir it's got ink in it air needs to replace the ink yeah similar capacities yes. why it do that brian why it why, why it, it be like this? why it do that all right so i'm gonna try not yeah. to i'm gonna try not to deep dive too bad on this but i will say the answer is complex um and oh boy. it's not 100 percent agreed upon in the pen community even amongst mm. like pen makers and nib meisters um as to exactly what's going on here so there is a little bit of a mysterious kind of uh vibe i'm not going to say it goes borderline paranormal but i will mystique. say i will say there's some mystique and a little bit of you know perhaps controversy about what's actually causing it so anyway Ooh. um just to just to, for those who don't know what's going on in general eyedropper filling a pen that's when you have a pen traditionally that's well okay way back in the day before you had a lot of it hey, hold, hold on, hold on. How, how about I'm how about i do I? the i'm already doing how it. about I, you explain, right, here, you explain I, it. okay go ahead set it up, right. set up, set up. eyedroppering is when you take a single piece barrel fill the whole thing with ink mm -hmm. secure it so that it doesn't link using an o-ring or an eyedropper mm -hmm. and put it so that the barrel of the pen is your ink reservoir there burping is when you get bursts of ink from the nib or the feed onto the paper because something hinky is happening with the air ink interchange mm -hmm. in that and eyedroppered pens like shazina says yeah. are universally agreed upon as being more prone to that well said all right, now you go so what with, I, you, with, what with I, your stuff. What I was going to say, well, you're like, why is it called eyedropper? What is that even about? So it's called eyedropper because before you had like modern filling mechanisms, most fountain pens were filled in this manner. It was just a big open cavity inside the pen. 
and um, there was not a built-in filling mechanism into the pens back in the in the early days. And even once these mechanisms were designed, they were patented and stuff like that. So eyedroppering has been around for a while and you would have like a medicinal eyedropper with a bottle of ink that you would fill the pen with. That's why they are called eyedropper. But these days, not a lot of pens are designed from the ground up to be like filled with the whole body. Opus 88 is one example that they are designed that way. Uh, Namiki Emperor is filled that way. Um, so there are some, but it's not most pens. Most of the time these days is what um, uh, Shazine is talking about here, like the Pilot Plumix. It's a cartridge converter pen that, that is being converted to an eyedropper pen. So anyway, that's what we're talking about here because I think maybe eyedropper design pens might be slightly different in terms of how they're designed, but in general, I think it just all gets lumped into one thing um, as to, you know, pens where the whole body is filled with ink, right? Um, so there is debate in the pen industry about why exactly this happens. It's pretty well understood that you'll get burping when you have an eyedropper converted pen uh, when the ink level gets really low because there's a lot of air inside the pen. That everybody agrees on. You can objectively see that this is what's happening. The why is where the debate is. Now, traditionally, the thing that's gotten passed around a lot and said is what Shazine is talking about here, the, the air from your hand heating up the pen and thus heating up, sorry, the heat from your hand heating up the pen and thus heating up the air inside the pen, increasing the pressure and causing it to burp more. I don't- I know that's that's debatable. That has been the common standard passed around explanation as to why this happens. But there are definitely reasons to be skeptical about that. I've never actually seen scientific proof that this is what is happening. It kind of makes some sense, but at the same time, kind of what Shazine is saying, wouldn't that also happen on piston pens and, you know, vacuum pens or other things that, you know, that have that going on? So um, it wouldn't happen necessarily with a cartridge pen because the cartridge itself would have kind of an insulation effect happening. But anyway, so um, I don't know how much of a factor that is, or it could be one factor, you know. What I've heard from other people saying that basically when you have, you know, this balance of air and ink, that has to happen in order for the ink to properly flow through the pen. If you have a lot of air in the ink chamber, that creates instability in the, you know, balance of that air ink interchange, which kind of makes sense too. So it doesn't really necessarily have to do with the heat of your hand. It just has to do with the fact that it's harder for that ink to keep its like surface tension when there's a lot of air kind of behind it in that ink chamber. And it's more likely to just like wobble around inside of there and then break its tension and kind of burp out of the pen. So again, I don't know how to like scientifically prove that either, or it could be maybe both factors at play. So that's not necessarily the exact question, but I think it kind of fits into it a little bit because obviously something is causing this and it's happening more on some pens than others. So that's the debate as to what causes it exactly. Um, my, this is where I'm gonna get into, not necessarily scientifically proven, but my thesis or hypotheses. I guess I'll say not a thesis, I'm not going for a doctorate here. I'm no, I'm no Dr. Brown, that's for sure. What I'll say is I have a hypothesis that there's probably some sort of, I don't know, call it ink stability curve inside a pen where there's a certain proportion of ink inside the chamber and air inside the chamber. And if you are going past a certain ratio of ink to air, then you are creating perhaps a greater degree of instability and you're more likely to see burps happening. That probably has factors to do with temperature. It probably has factors to do with barometric pressure. It probably has factors to do with, you know, how you're writing and how quickly speed and stuff like that, because it's basically agitation. I think there are probably several factors at play because it is also not universal that like, if you eyedropper a pen, it's gonna burp like crazy. Because I've I've, I've, I've eyedropper plenty of pens and never really had a problem. Other people, they seem to have problems left and right. So I think there's a multitude of factors that it's just really hard to know because we're not you know, using scientific instruments on these things. Now, what I will say related to the eyedropper versus piston, generally speaking, 
eyedropper converted pens, even on pens that don't seem that big, are going to have a pretty noticeably higher ink capacity than any piston filling pen would because the piston mechanism actually takes up more room in there than you would think. Um, speaking specifically here about your Twisby Eco, the most ink that you can get into that pen, as we've measured, is 1.76 milliliters of ink. And that's not just the ink chamber, that's the whole feed and everything. So it's probably closer to a mil and a half inside that ink chamber. Whereas eyedropper converting a Pilot Plumix is three milliliters or somewhere thereabouts. So, so it's about twice the size of the ink chamber. So if you're, you have just a little bit of ink left in there, you have significantly more air inside an eyedropper Plumix than you would in even a very large size piston capacity like a Twisby Eco. And that's on the bigger end of piston filling pens. So my hypothesis is that when you reach some point of probably two milliliters or maybe a little more than that, you're gonna to start to get to the point where burping is gonna be more of an issue when your ink level gets really low because you get such an, ink, an air capacity in there that's, that's gonna be an issue and you just don't have many piston pens that get above that. Again, it could be somewhere higher or lower than that, but that's just my guess just because you don't hear of a lot of issues with uh, piston pens burping a lot, though it certainly could happen. Um, vacuum fillers, they're a little bit different beast. Um, most of the vacuum fillers do actually get over that two milliliter mark, including like the VAC 700, Custom 823, but they're also in a slightly different category because they have sealed ink chambers. So they're actually designed so that when the knobs are screwed all the way down, the ink chamber completely closes off, which would then of course not burp because you are locking that ink inside there. Now, if you open it up, it's possible you could still get some burping, but even still, I think that that mechanism in there is doing something to mess with it. I don't hear of that really being an issue for people writing with vac filling pens. Uh, and having burping issues. I don't know about you, Drew, but I've never really experienced that myself. And I don't know. If no, that's honestly, the only the only um, the eco burps sometimes, but that's just because it needs to be blotted. And you know, when it when you fill mm -hmm. it, it can have a lot a little for whatever reason the the feeder has more of a propensity to hold ink. But no, with, yeah. with vacuum fillers, uh, even if you have the seal open um, as you're running low, I have not heard of that being a big problem. Yeah. So I think there's probably a multitude of factors here that when everything, when the stars align, burping is gonna be a real problem for you. Um, and then also, you know, it could have to do with viscosity of the ink as well as a whole other factor. So it could vary depending on the ink that you're using as well. So too many factors to say definitively as a blanket statement, what's exactly going on. But I think in general, it, it largely has to do with the size of the ink chamber and how much air is in there in relation to the ink. And uh, you know, you're know you getting that much more on eyedropper converted pens than you are on, uh, on piston pens. Um, the last thing I'll say is because this is the Plumix that you're talking about here. Now the Pilot Plumix has been discontinued. We've carried it for a decade, but they're no longer, uh, I don't know if they're no longer making it at all, but it's not being brought into the US. Um, this is one of those pens where you hear about, can you eyedropper convert it? And some people are like, yeah, of course. Other people are like, no way, it leaks right out of the pen. It's very inconsistent because a lot of times the little um, injection molding hole that they have at the very back of the pen, sometimes it's sealed and sometimes it's not. So, yep. um, uh, you know, what, uh, what Shanice is talking about here is um, actually sealing it with glue, you know, and to seal it off because you need a sealed body to eyedropper it. So, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I, I don't have enough information to say definitively here, but if you are modifying your pen in some way to give it a sealed body, it's possible there could be a slight leak somewhere, which that of course, if there's any kind of a leak anywhere, that is gonna just make your ink wanna dump out of that pen. So, you know, that could be a factor as well. If ever you have, you know, silicon grease that's not sealing up the threads all the way, you know, maybe it would be enough to have the ink leak out of the pen, maybe not. If you have any kind of crack in your housing, if the feed is not settled right or something like that, any type of messing with the air ink interchange, because the filler hole that you have in the back of that feed, air is actually flowing into the pen as ink is going out of it. You know, that's how these pens are able to write you know, <laughs> I love the way that Richard Bender has always talked about fountain pens as being a controlled leak. That's all these things are. So they're not 100% sealed, 
And they're not just open flowing either, or else the pens would just immediately dump out, like as if you poured a cup of water. There's a balance to be struck there between the surface tension that's in this ink, which is mostly water, and you know, allowing it to flow through capillary action through the feed channel. If the channel's too wide, it's gonna pour out. If your air, you know, your your filler hole allows too much air to come in, it's gonna write too wet. There's all kinds of engineering that goes into designing these, you know, ink, you know, uh, feed mechanisms um, that allow this ink to flow through. And if any part of that is off, you're gonna end up with either, either a stingy pen or a pen that burps and dumps ink everywhere. So anytime you're modifying the pen or doing eyedropper type stuff, you're adding extra variables into that and you could be contributing to some of that uh, instability and that air ink interchange. So I think that's why, generally speaking, most people don't like messing with eyedroppers because there's just too many variables and too inconsistent of an experience. And that's why a lot of manufacturers these days aren't making eyedropper pens too, is because there's just too many variables. So um, yeah, I would say I don't have definitive answers to this, but I think that, uh, you know, we pretty much covered what I was trying to say at least. So there you go. Sort of a deep dive. I guess I was kind of a deep dive, wasn't it, Drew, at that point? Yeah. It, it was all true. You're still with me, so. I'm still you here. You haven't passed out under your desk. I can't so. go anywhere. Fair enough. Captive captive audience. <laughs> captive audience, right. All right. Let's move on then to the next question. This one's from Sandy. Sandy says, hey, guys, of course, of, of course, I'm a total fan. Thank you, Sandy. Please accept my practical compliment on your outstanding technology, video work, links, and time tabs. Hey. Oh, thank you. That there you go. Takes, that takes time. <laughs> I appreciate yes, that. Yes, Drew it does a lot of that, so thank you. Uh, questions. Number one, I believe that I frequently splay a couple of number six Yovo nibs when inserting it in a Jinhao X750 or a Conklin host. How can that be? If so, will it eventually tire out the metal? I don't splay by pressing down hard on the nibs. Okay. Uh, this may be better phrased. How to set friction fit number six nib and feed so it won't splay or squeak. Thank you. So we're talking about like swapping nibs, installing nibs that maybe aren't from that particular manufacturer. So uh, Drew, you've got a lot of experience in this way and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Um... Splaying, that's that's the interesting part. Let me, let me just start off by saying anytime you swap nibs, you're, it, it is a modification. It's a light modification, a common modification, but it is nonetheless a modification. And it's unlikely that swapping nibs will result in a 100% identical matchup for you. And it's very common to have your tines misaligned that you would then need to correct before you can get started writing again. If you ever do anything like nib swapping, always check your tines with the loop to make sure that they are aligned before you start um, going to write and then, you know, end up uh, potentially messing up things further or taking it to some sort of abrasive to correct it without having it aligned. So always check your alignment. That can happen. Uh, splaying is definitely less common. Um, but uh, I will say that even if two number six size nibs, if it is understood that these are both number six, uh, they might at first glance look identical. The curvature of the nib might be slightly different compared to the curvature of the feed because that's really what needs to happen, right? The curvature of the nib needs to match perfectly the curvature of the feed. They need to mate up perfectly so that they can then be inserted into the grip section housing and have that perfect marriage of air and ink happening. If they don't match up, then yes, you can get splayed tines because the feed will be pressing too hard up against those tines and cause them to open up a little bit, just kind of just opening them by pushing. And then you could also get squeaking as well. A lot of folks think that squeaking primarily comes from tines rubbing together, which can happen. But a lot of the times squeaky nibs come from the fact that the nib base, like the part that's back in the pen, is kind of uh, wobbling up against the feed and the housing and causing a squeak as well. It's kind of hard to hear because you know, you're talking about a very, very small piece. So hearing the difference between a squeak here and a squeak there, yeah, I, my hearing's not that good. So I don't know, maybe yours is, but it's tripped me up a few times. Um, I will say that modern Conklin nibs, since that's what we're talking about here, are identical to the modern stock nibs produced by Yovo. Yovo makes Monteverde nibs and Conklin nibs right now. And I actually measured them with some digital calipers just to make sure because Yovo also makes nibs for Twisby, but they're not 
the stock Yovo shape. They're their own special shape. So I was curious. It's like, well, maybe there are some slight differences since Monteverdi and Conklin pens use different feeds than you would see traditionally on a lot of other Yovo pens. But I can say that they are identical. I measured them from multiple points using digital calipers. They are the exact same nib, just with different imprints. So I can I can guarantee that for you. So um, swapping a Jinhao onto a Conklin should be just fine. It, it really should, uh, in theory. Um, uh, Jin Hao is another uh, another situation. Um, sorry, I think you meant Yovo. Swapping a Yovo onto a Conklin. You said Jin Hao, but I'm sorry. Yep. Yes. Okay. Swapping a Yovo onto a Conklin should be no problem. There you go. Jin Hao, however, is thank you, Brian, is a completely different story. Those nibs are not made by Jin Hao. They are not identical. However, the practice of putting a stock Yovo nib, be it a Franklin Christoph, a Goulet, an Edison, whatever, a Conklin Monteverde, is probably the most common nib swapping practice in fountain pens right now everybody does it it's super common and we you know at the company you know when we were in when i was in the customer care department did not hear a lot of issues with that usually they work just fine so i can't say that that uh, that practice is fraught here are my recommendations um for you sandy um so splaying occur occurs when the feed is so tied up against the when the sorry when the fit is so tight up against the feed that it's pushing up against mm. the um the nib itself so uh, this is probably something you've already done already done but i need to say check your orientation um a lot of nibs sorry a lot of feeds are keyed to the housing meaning they have a flat portion that limits the orientation that it can be inserted into so it, however if the feed is inserted try, like, without show, using that correct show, orientation show visually while you're talking here i don't know if this will work yeah out, if, but. if the feed gets inserted without being mm -hmm. properly oriented then you could be putting undue pressure and stress on that nib which could be causing the splayed times mm -hmm. that you mentioned you know and i've seen that happen with noodlers a lot where i'll insert it one way those aren't key They're, you can insert those any way however because of certain imperfections in the grip section or inconsistencies i won't say imperfections you can insert it one way and the feed will be pressing up against the tines so that they splay take it out turn it put it in the other way and they're fine um nibs like uh, feeds like yovo and the feeds that are on your conklin and monteverdes mm -hmm. they shouldn't be able to be rotated within that housing there's only one way they can go the yovo feeds the ones that you'll find on edison franklin Christoph, and such they're a little bit more subtly keyed than the feeds that monteverde and conklin have like the flat part portion is not quite as noticeable but it's definitely there so you could feasibly insert that one the wrong way the conklin and monteverde ones i don't think you could but if you really tried, then maybe. So just make sure your orientation is correct. Make sure you're not doing anything, um, you know, backwards. And make sure that when you um, do insert your nib in the feed, it's possible you could insert your feed all the way and then take your nib and cram that in there. I think you're asking for trouble personally when you do that. You, It could be done for sure. It's going to not feel great on your fingers. I prefer kind of sandwiching the nib and the feed together and then inserting them both into the grip section as one cohesive unit. I feel like that's been way more successful for me and it helps me ensure that the nib is not going too far in to the section. I, I get to situate them just as, you know, the way I want them to be in the pen and then I keep them in that orientation and then put them in. So also don't, if you do have a nib that can go farther down into the grip section uh that could be putting undue stress on it as well if you're moving it past its comfort zone it could be stretched out and the shoulders could be pressed up and your tines could be splayed as well so just make sure it's not too far back that could also be what's causing the splayed tines but mm -hmm. like i said splayed tines are not a really common issue misalignments are much much more common so um uh so yeah splaying is that misalignment mm -hmm. is you know that uh so i think if you're using splaying the way i think you're meaning then uh, that is uncommon for sure but hopefully yeah, some yeah. of these things well, have helped i'm having a real thought i'm trying to show this like why do i have a matte black pen trying to show this yeah so of splaying, course. Yeah, whatever's lying around splaying if you have too much pressure on the feed it'll spread the tines just like that. So I'm pushing up yeah. on the feed. That's what Drew is talking about. Yeah, and that your feed could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, your feed could press up against the uh, underside of your nib, creating those 
splayed tines. Yeah, I think that's usually more of a circumstance if you're taking a nib alone and putting it on a different pen. If that feed is not matched up right to where that that new nib that you're putting in there, it could be putting too much pressure up on it. Um, and like Drew said, like I tried to show earlier while he was talking, not sure how much you could see it, that keyed, you know, opening on the, the Conklin pen here that I have. Um, it's pretty tough to fit it in, not in the direction that it's yeah, meant to I've go. Never, I've never tried, but it looks impossible. But there are, there are certain other pens where it's possible to put it in off kilter. And especially if you have, just have no idea, you don't know that it's supposed to go like that. You could like really jam it in there. So then all kinds of weird things can happen. I think usually you end up with um, tines that actually get pinched together too much and you end up with misalignment more than splaying, kind of like what you said, but I don't know. That's uh, Yep, it can go either way. That's so hopefully thing. one of those things could help you out. I'm sorry that's happening. It's definitely not a common one, but uh, yeah. try, try some of those and see how it goes. There you go. All right, cool. All right, Great. and our final question for this week comes to Ooh. us from Alan Bryan. And Alan asks the very good question, what are some signs that your windowless piston filler is about to run out of ink? Mm. And what can one do to eke out a few more lines of writing if you need to finish your thought before hitting empty? Thanks in Turkey Hammock. Hey, Alan, love it. Yes. True, true fan. Um, This is tough because you have very little to go on visually here. Um, yes. Windowless mean mean there's no ink window, so it's basically just most a pen. most piston pens do have an ink window. Um, it's 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 oh come on, most of them, yes. Devil's no, Advocate, um, Brian. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I could say most. Most? Oh come on, yes you can. There are plenty of pens that don't. I'll say that. There are plenty that don't. Um, anyway, most of the ones that we carry do, but we carry a lot of demonstrators too. Anyway. Yeah, it's definitely good to see your ink level, but not every, you can't always do that. But you know what, look, it's not necessarily piston, right? This could be any pen, literally any pen you're talking about. If you don't have an ink window, so I mean, I don't think this is specific to pistons. I think this is right. any pen. So I'm gonna, I didn't really even get into detail in my answer in my notes about it being a piston. Um, really, this is just any pen that you can't see the ink level in there. How do you know mm -hmm. if you're running out of ink? Um, basically, you don't really know until you're pretty much out, which is what kind of sucks. Well, with converters, you can always take the barrel off. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's where this this question uh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, a piston pen with yeah. no window, there's literally no way to tell. Oh, true, true. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, yeah, so you can't just open it up and check real quick. Okay, I got you. Um, okay, so say you're in a, a situation like that where you can't check anything visually, um, at least not that you would think. Ha! Ah, hmm. I mean, yeah. So Intrigue. Anyway, maybe not. Um, what you got, Brian? Tell us. <laughs> well, basically, I mean, you really have nothing to go on because it's not like, it's not like you get a lot of time. Like you basically, your pen's flowing and flowing and flowing and it's going to flow at the rate that it's going to flow. It's just however much is left in the reservoir behind the feed where it's flowing through. And at the point where something changes, like your ink starts to write drier or you start to get some skipping and stuff like that where you can tell like, oh gosh, I'm sort of running. You know, it's as if you're driving your car and it starts like sputtering because you're on empty. Like, it's sort of like asking, what can you do to just have the car go a little further once you're already on empty? It's like, well, I don't know. Put it in neutral and hope you can roll I, further. I definitely like, think you can do you can definitely do more with your pen than you can your car for probably. sure to get to, to get a little bit more out. Yeah, yeah, true. But I mean, like it's you're kind of in the same boat though. You're not really getting any notice. It's not like once you're a third, you know, you have a third left of ink. You're like, oh, I'm getting warning in advance that I'm almost out of ink. You're pretty much like at the point where it starts to skip and all that. You're like, I can maybe get two more words in and then it's out. Yeah, it's not like there's like ink hiding somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so that is a little tough, but, um, you know, that's pretty much when, you know, is when it starts to either feel dry, it starts to, the line starts to write really fine. You start to get some skipping. The ink seems really weak, or you, f you feel like you're having to put more pressure down to get ink to flow through it. Uh, that basically means that you're about out. Um, and really the only thing that you can do to extend that at all is to either put more ink in it, obviously, which is the best solution uh, or you know dilute it if you have 
you know, a small cup of water or something like that. You can dip it in the water, you know, dilute it a little bit and hope to get it further out. It's obviously going to make your writing look weaker and different and kind of weird, but you might be able to write just a little bit more with it if you're in no other situation, you know, where you don't have any other pen access or ability to fill it with ink. Um, personally, I think if you're going to do that, if you have any ink nearby, ideally, obviously the ink that you have inked up in the pen, you can just dip the pen in the ink and use it like a dip pen. You can actually get quite a bit just with what fills up in the feed that if you have that option is probably the most preferred option. Yeah, if you feeds to hold, feeds hold a surprisingly large amount of ink. Yeah. But honestly, if you're already doing that, might How well much more work is it to just twist yeah. the knob and then it's what, five extra seconds of work? So yeah. I'm struggling to think of what situation you're going to be in where you are just, it's impractical to do anything else. Like I'm, I'm thinking you don't have the ink around. That's the situation you'd be in. So yes, ideally you could dip the ink, but you might as well just fill it. If you have water around, I mean, I, I guess if you're in like a dire situation, you could like spit on the nib or something and do that if you absolutely had to. But I'm really struggling to think of any other situation where, you know, you just use a different pen. Like, <laughs> have you got any ideas, Drew? I do, actually. I didn't okay. write anything down because okay. I forgot about this because this is a very ah. oft forgotten about thing. But I actually mm. think I have a legit answer, Brian. Okay. The Aurora Piston. <laughs> okay. Right? Well, Yes. So Aurora, like if, okay, like, yes. Aurora, yeah, so, Aurora has, I guess like a, call it a little reservoir in their piston design. But Drew, that's not a windowless pen. So oh, it's darn, not actually right. getting to the spirit. God, I forgot what the question was. I yeah. just got excited. I'm like, the Aurora can do that. So technically yes. Aurora, Aurora pistons, they have this basically like, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just well, the, it's, it's, it's so like the, a pocket there's a, inside the, the seal where a little yeah. bit of extra ink will hang up there. So yeah. If you are, if you run out of ink inside the barrel, if you actually turn the piston all the way down so that the seal itself, you know, is all the way down as if you're going to fill the pen, that little extra ink that's hanging up in the seal will make contact with the back of the feed and it'll allow you to write just a little bit more. So that's, yeah. that's something kind of cool that not a lot of people know about Aurora, but is there, is there, is there an Aurora, Aurora that pen. doesn't have a window? Is there an Aurora piston filling I mean, pen that doesn't have a window? Yeah, I'm sure. But you're talking about a pretty narrow selection here. I don't know. I think they all have windows. I mean, if you're going to like have that as your solution, you could just carry around like a Peniter pen filler or Visconti traveling ink yeah. pot or I think something. All the ones we, I think all the ones we sell have windows, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, now, one thing that you can do, okay, so if you are like, I don't want to get to the point where I am completely out and then having to spit on my nib to write with it. I don't actually know if that works. I'm just totally theorizing. <laughs> don't do that. that. It's really gross. You shouldn't do that. Um, but if you, especially in like COVID age, don't spit God. on your, don't spit on your paperwork. And don't spit people. on anything. Um, that's gross. Don't do that. Um, so uh, you can actually, there is a way for you to check if you have ink in your piston filling pen what? before it's completely out. <gasps> I know. Oh. Do tell. So in order to do this, it's nothing magical. And you can do this with a converter pen too, though converters are almost always clear. So you don't have to do this, but whatever. Um, so I have a Twisby here for demonstration purposes. So say this was a piston filling pen that did not have a visual indicator of its ink level. So if you have the nib turned upside down, like I do, and you are, you know, turning the piston forcing it towards the nib. Uh, you can see here that the ink that I have is moving upwards. I'm expelling the air out because I have it pointed up. Do not do this with the nib pointed down. You will get ink everywhere if you have it inside your pen. Um, I am turning the piston. I'm expelling all of the air. You wanna go slow. But if you get to the point where you bottom out the piston and you can start to see there's some ink that starts to come up through the feed. You don't wanna go up past the point where <laughs> it starts to come out of the feed, but I can tell there that I've got ink left, you know, enough to be able to, you know, carry on my wayward son. But uh, if I'm doing that and I know I'm like, like I had to, to untwist that quite a bit, right? So I get all the way up there and I see by the time I bottom out the piston, I'm like, oh, it just barely started to come out of there. 
I, I don't have a whole lot of ink left in this thing. You know, there is going to be some left in the feed. There is going to be, you know, I've got a little bit of ink in here, but you know, if, if I'm doing that and I get just a teeny little bit, I know I should probably think about refilling at some point soon. If I just start to turn it and it ink starts coming up right away, I'm like, all right, this thing is pretty much capped out. Like I've got a lot of ink in here. So depending on how many times you're having to turn, and it's going to vary depending on the pen. You need to know your pen a little bit, but I'm assuming you might, if it's a piston pen, you're using it all the time. Um, but if you're, if you twist it all the way up and no ink comes up out of the pen at all, then you know that you're on borrowed time and you need to fill that thing the next opportunity that you can. So that is one visual indicator that you can use when you can't see inside the pen at all. You can expel it and you can see approximate, you know, where your ink level might be. Um, that said, it is risky because if you're just kind of going to town, you can pretty easily just like, like poop a bunch of ink out and then you get it all over Don't your fingers and everything and then it's kind of a mess but nice little hack that's not even the tip of the week but i just gave you an extra bonus tip for checking on your piston ink capacity when you have no window there you go well you know what brian hmm it's about that time you know what i think it is time for tip of the week isn't it drew so this was actually i don't even think i don't know maybe this was strategic on your part drew these Two things segue so nicely <laughs> into each other. But the, tip no. of the, the tip of the week that Drew wanted me to talk about today was a tip for inverting your piston or vac filling pen in order to get a full filling. Okay, so what the heck does that, was that mean? What does that mean? So basically, when you're filling your pen, right, you have your ink bottle, you have, which you have to have because piston and vacuum filling pens they don't use cartridges or anything. You have to use an ink bottle. So when you're going to fill it, you have the nib pointed down, right? And any air that would be happening in the filling process is all gonna be kind of up towards the back of the pen. Well, if you notice, anytime you're trying to fill a piston or a vacuum filling pen, pretty much, I mean, there are some pens that are designed really well and you can actually get a full filling just by doing it over and again a couple of times. Like usually if you fill it, expel everything out again and fill it again, that is pretty much gonna get you as much as you can sort of naturally get into your pen. And it's usually doing it that second time, will expel any extra air that was in the feed and you'll get, you know, a pretty significant amount more. So that right there is a little hack, you know, fill it up, expel it, fill it again. But if you are doing that and it's still, there's a pocket of air up there, if you just like really wanna max out how much ink that you're getting into this pen, there's a little hack that you can do, which is, not unlike what I just talked about with that tip of checking the ink mm. level. So if I filled my pen, granted this pen is not very full that I'm demonstrating with, but if I wanna get it as full as possible, it's very easy with a piston filling pen. It's kind of a nightmare with a vacuum filling pen and in my opinion, not worth it, but I'll teach you the principle. So basically you, you turn the nib up towards the sky, inverting it as Drew called it, and you expel the air out. So you're getting it to the point where the ink is basically getting up to the feed. And then you go back into your ink bottle. You start filling it up. There's nothing, there's no air in this thing at all because you've expelled all the air out of the pen. And then when you go to fill it, all you're getting is ink and you'll be able to max out the filling of that pen. So that's what we're talking about here. Now there's a little bit of risk because you can overdo it and I think they come out, but yeah. I was gonna say, I've done this before a couple times. I've done it with a recently filled pen and with a pen that I just kind of wanted to add more ink to. Okay. Way, way easier and way less messy with an ink that with a pen you're already adding ink to because the feed is much less saturated at that point. Yeah. It's like it's like normal writing saturated, not just recently inked saturated. So if you're if you've just filled and you're like, oh, I want to get some more in there and you start ejecting it, you know, it's kind of like a syringe, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you know, bringing it up right toward that mm -hmm. level and that feed is really saturated, you're going to get some spillage. So but you, if you're you wanna, just refilling, there's much less spillage. So you want a little bonus hack here? A no. Little, yes. This I'm is kidding. Like a, of like course a, I want a bonus like hack. Like a super pro tip. So just the concept of inverting this thing and getting more of a filling, that's like already a pro tip, but the super pro tip. Mm -hmm. This is how the pros walk around without ink all over their fingers, right? Whoa. So when you're going to fill your piston filling pen, again, that's easier than a vac filler. I'll kind of talk about that in a second. Only fill it halfway. 
So only get about this much ink in there. Then, then invert it and continue to fill it, but fill it with air. What that's gonna do is gonna suck all that fresh mm. ink that you've just drawn up. It's gonna suck it all out of the feed down into the barrel. Then you do your inversion thing where you push it back up into it and you don't have the issue that you just talked about because what Drew said is if you go to fill the pen and you've moved the piston all the way back, fresh out of a bottle of ink, and then you go to invert it and you try to expel the air out. Essentially what you've got is you've got ink in the pen, you've got some air up at the top of the chamber and you've got ink in the feed. And when you go to expel it, it's gonna wanna push the ink out of the feed and you're mm -hmm. gonna make a mess. But if you do it halfway, flip it over, continue to do it, you're, that air that it's drawing in is sucking all that extra ink out. I know that, I always forget about that. I, I, I know that, well, I've been told that, I've heard that and yep. I never do it. Never yeah. do it. This is uh, what ah. separates the well, the here's wheat from the, thing. the chaff here, Drew. I don't well, know. I also never, I also very rarely use the same one. When I get low on ink, I, I generally don't use it again. And, true, uh, true. I don't, but and you, yeah, that that's yeah. those are some solid hacks. They are now. I feel like I need to cover vac fillers because we did mention that. So similar principle when you're talking about a vac filler. More risky. It's definitely more risky, in my opinion. It is not worth it because vac fillers already have such a high ink capacity, the risk versus the reward ratio is not, it's not there. It, it's it's not, not beneficial enough on a vac filler. Um, but I'll talk about it anyway, just in case you wanna do. So a vac filler, it doesn't, you don't have as much control. Like the vac, the whole vacuum filling process is is dramatic, right? Like it's reactionary. Yeah, you're, you're, you're pushing it down, you're pushing it, pushing it down, and then it's like, plow, it's like an explosion of ink comes up into the pen. Well, you can't really control that so easily. Technically, nah. you can if you want to. So what you can do with that is sort of what I just talked about. You do a you know normal vacuum filling, you're gonna get it to about here, right? On a normal fill. Honestly, if you just do it a couple of times, you'll get it up to like three quarters of the way. That's plenty of ink. That's, That's fine. So much freaking That's ink. That's fine. You're Just gonna be fine. Be happy. But <laughs> if you really like want to max it out, okay, sure, you can do that. Basically, what you do is something similar to what you just did, except you know it's the vacuum. And the way that this vacuum mechanism works is as soon as you move it past this point here, the seal makes contact with the barrel, and it creates a vacuum when you force it down. So you don't want to go all the way back with it right? What you want to do is once you have this thing kind of filled with ink, you bring it back maybe just a little bit, like a half inch or so. And then, you know, maybe a little bit further, you then start to push it up. Again, I don't have ink in here and I'm not going to demonstrate it because I'm going to spill ink all over my computer and I'm not going to do that. But when this thing is filled with ink, you bring it about halfway, you start to push it up a little bit until the ink starts to kind of make its way up into the feed. But then you have to wow. like sort of hold that exactly where it is, then put it back into the bottle and then you got to push it back down. Yep. It can be done. I've done it successfully many times. Yeah. But I've actually, also made I will, a mess several times too. You you did a video on this too. I will link it in um, in the notes yeah. right here and, and below. So uh, you can watch him do it. So that is a process. Honestly, if you're going to invest in a vac filler and you like to have it filled all the way anyway, get yourself some sort of pen filler or traveling ink pot. That is the best way to fill these things anyway. You, and just in the process of using one of those, you already have the, it inverted and literally you just go like, and it things the, filled the, all the way, no mess, easy. Yeah, the VAC 20 ink well for that one specifically. Oh, if that got one a works VAC great. Seven, yeah. If you've got a VAC 700 or a VAC mini. Because then it VAC screws 20. onto it, yeah. But any of those three will work yeah. really great for any vacuum filling pen. You're good to go. It's worth the few dollars of investment if you're that you know, determined to max out the pen. But there you yep. go, all kinds of fun hacks you can play with. Y'all are gonna have some very inky fingers this weekend. I, I'm, I'm just visualizing it. <laughs> nah, they're pros. No inky fingers for the pros. Super pros. All right, moving on to the pen spotlight, the Edison Beaumont. Hey, let's talk about the Edison Beaumont, Brian. This one doesn't get spoken about very much. Yeah, we haven't talked about this one in a while, have we? I don't know why. Did you know this is my second favorite Edison? 
Your second favorite Edison. Second favorite, yeah. It's your the, penultimate uh, Edison, you could say. Ah, uh, yes. I actually, you know what? I, I looked up that word recently because yeah. I it wanted- It doesn't mean wanted, number one. It means number two. I know, People I get know. I wanted all the time. I wanted to use it in a video. I'm like, our penultimate, but I'm like, wait, no, that doesn't, because it's pen like, and ultimate, like yeah. it could be such a great play on words, Yeah, but no. It means it second just, best. No. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. Anyway, but yes, uh, the Ascent <laughs> is my favorite. Um, okay. And then the Beaumont is is my second favorite. Interesting. So okay. I, I appreciate, I, I like the smaller mm. uh, pens. I don't like the larger Edison pens. Um, no? Even the, you know even the, the... Premier? No, no, no Collier for me. No, sir. Really? No, no. See, too I big. like it. I like it. It doesn't post. I don't like it. I like, I like That's both. That's true. I, I like pens that post and post deep. I appreciate that. The, but the Beaumont... Yeah. Um, I still like the, Edison, the the Ascent, but the Beaumont gets points for me because of that extra trim ring. Mm. I think that's really sharp and also Classy. not something that's super common with the rest of the Edison lines. It takes extra extra effort mm. to put that trim in there. It does. Um, so I, I it gets points for me on that. And it's a smaller pen with the full-size nib. I mm. love that. The nib the looks thing, the really, thing, it looks bigger on that pen. It does. It's the same nib, but it just looks bigger. It's a smaller pen. The yeah. thing I don't like, though, is the current color selection. It doesn't have any colors mm. that like really wow me right now. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Because otherwise, that. I would I would have one. It I is, would have one absolutely. It is quite the hodgepodge currently yeah. of Beaumont colors. You got yeah. you got uh, what is it? The unicorn. Mm -hmm. uh, you got fireball. Fire. Mm -hmm. Fireball. Yeah. Fireball. Fireball and moonbreaker. Fireball. Yeah, Moonbreaker is pretty cool. That's I think that's that my looks favorite really good three, with the three. trim. Unicorn is cool material. I do like that a lot. It's yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, I mean, how do you feel about no the mic. grip? Because I know you have a specific, you have a specific preference for your grip shapes, right? I just don't. I just I just like them to be functional. I want my grip to be function over form. Because hmm. to, to me, to me, the pen needs to look cool while it's closed. I don't care what it looks like when it's open. Because when it's open, I'm just using it. I'm not looking at it. No. So okay. I, that that okay. that grip to me needs Fair to enough. just be performance based only. That's another reason I like the ascent okay. because the ascent tapers and then there's a big old honking stop sign that mm. doesn't let your fingers go past it. Basically, you it like flares a, you like out bump. significantly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love a good speed bump. See, and I, the, I'm different. I don't. I don't like the speed bump. Well, you just like living on the danger zone then, No, man. I don't even go close to the danger zone. My fingers are never that close to the nib. I hold my pens back. I, I got oh, really? Like I on got, the threads? I got big hands. There's no way my fingers you are just... getting that close. You know? I like, I right. like the grip. Uh, I actually really like the grip of the Beaumont because it's just, okay, that, it's just that concave. It's just, you know, oh, yeah. it just natural. Your fingers just want to seat right in there. Yeah. It's not this big obnoxious, like, you know, thing on the end that's like oh look out you're about to hit the oh nib. come on the ascent the ascent like, does not have a big enough i, I, I want to I agree with you grip than that i don't need no, a i want to agree with you telling me where oh, i should and shouldn't go oh okay. i want the freedom to put my fingers wherever i want but i like a little gentle like encouragement like just nest your fingers right in here you're gonna like it trust me right okay, in here the enough. beaumont's got that it's just this gentle concave the premiere's got that too that's why we did it on the premieres because i liked that grip more and so that's yeah. why we did it that way also you picked the grip on the ascent so don't even give me that malarkey well no actually i i um mm. what's what's the right word i uh, it's your pin bro it's your pen. It's a it's a Goulet exclusive. Don't say you didn't have any oh, feedback I on that. Oh, I say I. Uh, uh -huh. what's, what's the word? I uh, not consented. I I I whatever. I I I allowed it to happen, but it was not my preference. <laughs> we did it because we were Acqui like, acquiesced. I acquiesced it. Yeah. Okay. I I, adv I advocated. I was like, I really like the Premier Grip. We no, just, let's just this keep one's the a better same grip. grip. But Boo, the, the feeling no. was. You know, there's only so many things we can do to make these pens different from each other. So for our follow-up, we should do a different grip. And I was like, okay, so the one you grip have that to, I you wanted like the it. most, what we'd already used, so we we chose not to use that one. So I was like, okay, the next grip that I would prefer would be this one. So See, you, I, you're I, not incorrect, but you're also uh, completely wrong. So <laughs> I um, want to agree with you because I like the grip on the Beaumont a lot. I do like that wasted design. I yeah. like how your fingers lay into it. Yeah. But I have to. I now have to say you're a complete and total liar and you're wrong because you threw shade at my ascent grip. So I'm sorry. We have to be enemies I now. I am. We're really, you know, we're actually. You, 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 you cast the first stone, my friend, <laughs> and now this is we are destined to be adversaries. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, All sorry. Right. Fair enough. 
All right. Worst grip ever now. That's what we needed in this pen cast. A, a little more controversy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but no, boo. I like it. What, what, what do you think about the clip? The clip's a little bit different. It is, yeah. The clip is a very classic kind of a clip. You know, it reminds yep. me of a lot of the like Namiki pens or the Custom 74, mm-hmm. you know, just that taper with a ball. You can't go wrong with it. It's never going to like, I'm not going to sleep at night dreaming about a clip like that, <laughs> you know, it, but it's pleasing. You know, it's fine, but it's not like, wow, look at the feature of this pen. And I think honestly, that's, you know, that's been going back way back, even to when we were designing the Premiere. I mean, choosing a clip for an Edison pen is very difficult because it's, except for the, the Beaumont, which has the trim ring, other on all the other Edison pens, it is the only hardware, you know, cause the nib, you basically, it is what it is. Like, so you need something that complements it, but really the shape of the clip, it's got to work with the rest of the pen. So I think it works really well with the Beaumont. I think having yeah. the having the um, the flat top, a little bit of the the angle there. You know, I think it it complements well, like the symmetry and everything. It looks really good with that specific pen, um, and it's functional too. But it's not like, wow, look at that clip. You know, yeah. you want I the clip to I just. Th- compliment it but not stand out too much that's what you're going for and that's what he did with this this design i think you're right i think that the trim ring gives it more of a kind of classical look a little bit more yeah, it's like a little a, little more retro it's like um, the, it's like the cummerbund on the tuxedo <laughs> if you will yeah a little dated but still classic yeah like if you, don't, if you don't have it that's okay it's a little more modern but if yeah, you have but it you show like, up okay all right yeah, i'm wearing a cummerbund right now yeah oh are you yeah, yeah? Mm-hmm. you just feel more you can't comfortable tell? wearing a cummerbund you can't no? tell well it gives me confidence i have performance anxiety so i put the cummerbund on it's it's my <sighs> pencast cummerbund yes obviously you have performance anxiety you know clearly everybody can so tell. i i need to wear the cummerbund for confidence otherwise i would just be incapacitated with anxiety um <laughs> But no, I do think that the clip with the little ball on the end yeah. is an, is also very classical, and I think fair pairs enough. up well with yeah. the trim ring. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I think uh, the thing that I like the most about just really every Edison pen, you know, they're lighter pens. Um, they are really just made to be daily writers. You know, if you have heavier pens and stuff like that, and the balance is, you know, really like if you have a metal grip section and a resin barrel, I can really front weight it and kind of throw out the balance. These are very well balanced pens, posted and unposted. They're very light, even if you post the pen and write with the whole thing. I mean, I think it's 16 grams, the Beaumont total. So it's a very light pen in general. It's lighter than a Safari, actually. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, they're very comfortable to write with for long periods of time, which is really, that's really Edison's bread and butter. Cause you look at them and you're like, okay, cool. Like, I mean, they were, I guess, a little more unique in their design a decade or more ago. Nowadays, there's a lot of other pen designs. There's a lot of other independent pen makers and stuff that are doing, you know, things like this or doing some crazier designs. Edison's got like a bread and butter kind of spot, you know, and they they have a very loyal fan base of people that just love to write with those pens every day. And that's that's what they, they really rock that. So even looking at them, you know, just initially, you're like, what's so special about this pen sort of? I mean, they're very pleasing, but the fit and finish on them, the just the the... I don't know, satisfaction that so many people that we know get by actually using these things every day um, is definitely there. And it's really good people behind it too. Like they really stand behind their products. They have high quality standards. You know, they also, they have good yes. support. They really stand behind this stuff. They're made in the USA, made in Ohio. Um, so there's a, you know, we feel really good standing behind who makes these too. Yeah, and I will say that um, Brian Gray at the Edison Pen Company has a lot of similarities to our Brian over here at the Goulet Pen Company because Brian Goulet and Brian Gray both get a little obsessive about, you know, doing a good job at things to the point where it's kind of insane, but the end user gets to benefit from that. So uh, Brian Gray yeah. does not compromise on quality no. at all. No. Like he he is. So I would I would I'm not surprised that every time I get an Edison pen in my hand, I'm like, oh, my God, this feels good. Every single one, even mm-hmm. the Collier. It's not my favorite. But like you, you can't deny holding it feels really comfortable. Yeah. And I and that is none of that is just by coincidence. All of that is you know tried and tried and tried. Yeah. They manufacture so many experimental pens over there just to figure things out. Always you know mm-hmm. trying to make sure that uh, they can get a comfortable pen that writes well in people's hands. There you go. Uh, so the pens are 169 if you uh, prefer those. They come with a converter, Standard International. You can also eyedropper convert them if you are into that. 
though you I don't can. know why you would be after you've listened to this episode, but hey, it's your thing. They actually eye dropper really well. We, we don't. Yeah, they, I don't, they. I don't hear of his burping issues with their pens. They they have really tight tolerances on their threads and stuff like that. Most of the time, you don't even need silicone grease. It's always good to do that in general, but you do not need an O ring to eye dropper these pens. A little bit of silicone grease should be fine. But they've. But that is a threads. that is a manufacturing thing. Like they manufacture mm-hmm. them thinking with about that in that. mind. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the nibs, Yovo nibs. Stainless steel, same thing. I mean, you can get gold as an upgrade, um, but uh, it's pretty expensive to do that. And they're nice, but you don't have to do that. I would go with the steel. Um, but yeah, very solid. So if you've used Goulet nibs at all, it's very similar experience. So extra fine finding and broad. Uh, 1.1, I want to say, on a lot of their pens. I don't remember, but mm-hmm. great nibs. So yeah. yeah, all around good writing experience. Highly recommend. So yeah, thanks for bringing that one up, Drew. Yeah. All well, right. Well, th- that actually came from our users. We asked um, oh, if yeah. they would like anybody. They, they, we asked everybody if they would like for us to talk about anything in the spotlight, and the Beaumont came up. And I also took note of some other ones that came up, and we will be mm. speaking about that in next episode and episodes to come. So please continue to let us know. We'll yeah. keep a running list and get to it. Absolutely. All right. That's what we got for that one this week. Now we're going to move on to the total nonsense portion of what's happening in our lives. All right. Well, Brian, I'm going to start off with some pen-related total nonsense. You know about my three-pen rule. I do. I only ever keep three pens inked up at any given time. Which I wholeheartedly mo- disagree with, but respect, you, much. but respect you for. No, no. You have said you agree with it. You just can't do it. It's a better process. I just refuse to All right. try I it. Just, I, I need you to acknowledge that. All right. Respect where it's due, my friend. Okay. So, do you want to know how many pens I have inked up right now? I would guess three or less. <gasps> I have one inked up. One? And it is this stupid Fude nib pen. <laughs> sure, <laughs> this is it. This I, is all I got. I can't recall. It's probably been, you know, 12 years minus two days since I've had less than like one single pen inked I up. I don't want to have this one. I had a plan, Brian. So um, <laughs> we got in some new Sailor inks that I tested and I heard that they had really good shading properties. So I cleaned all my pens. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get ready. I'm going to use some of these. Um, and I didn't because I was like, eh, no, they're, they're, they're okay. But I, I didn't, I didn't jump all over any of them, but, uh, look at, look at what I have, Brian, look, three all-stars, um, there you can see. And then they, they're, they're, they pair up so perfectly with my synth, my synthscape case. And that's, I'm so excited. That's pretty like, solid. That's a pretty solid right? grouping right there. I will it admit. It is. Oh, and I'm so excited. I'm like, all right, I got, I've, I've got, uh, 1.1s, 1.5s on all of them, 1.9. And I'm like, I'm going to shade. I'm just going to shade like crazy. And none of them uh, knocked my socks off. So I was like, all right, now what do I do? So, and then I thought, all right, maybe, you know, we'll test some Ferris wheel press inks. I'll maybe ink up some of those. And I didn't. And so now I'm just, I just have this. I just have this with Noodler's Black in it, Brian. I don't even have a fun ink in oh, here. Oh, gosh. I know. I just True. wanted to test for perf- Rectify. I wanted to test Rectify just for perf- situation. This is unacceptable. This is a practical pen. I'm like, let me try the food I need. Let me put in something here that I'm, that's not wild and crazy. So I don't know, man. I'm just, I feel like, a, I feel like just a, like a darn mess right now. I, 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 what am I even doing? I need to just pick some inks and put them in the freaking pens. So that's just weird. I don't feel comfortable. I feel naked, and <laughs> I, at least I'm wearing my cummerbund, right? So that, anyway. that's what you got. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all I got. So I made some muffins, Brian, this weekend. That was exciting. Okay. Found a recipe for some blueberry lemon muffins. Ooh, that sounds good. They were amazing. They turned yeah? out really well, really, really well. Um, no butter, um, just oil, which was interesting. And they called for extra light olive oil. Um, yeah. But no butter, so that that was that was an interesting. Last uh, my other muffin recipes generally have uh, butter in them, but um, yeah, so you can use they them turn... pretty interchangeably, I believe. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a very strict recipe follower. My my wife not so much. Mm. Me, I'm like measuring everything, you know, laying things out in little cups and stuff okay. like that. And she, you know, especially she, with she's... baking, baking you have to be a lot more exact. I find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W- which she will admit I am more successful in my baking than she is, probably for that reason. Mm. But um, anyway, it was really successful. It had a nice little lemon uh, glaze drizzle happening. Uh, so that was that was delightful. And my wife and I started watching Hot Ones on YouTube. Have you ever seen those videos? Oh, yeah. Are, aren't they amazing? Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Fantastic. I would love it. I think there's a have Netflix any... special now with Hot Ones. I think they've actually developed it into a full-fledged show i don't oh, know if nice going from youtube to netflix i guess that's a step you know it's like maybe maybe it's like having a tv um, show but uh, you know. Co- Co- cobra kai did it 
there you Cobra go. Kai started so, on uh, YouTube. Yeah. Similar, similar path. But yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been hot ones. I've been watching them for years. Yeah, they're fantastic. oh really? Do you, like, let, let me know later if there are any like really, really good ones I need oh, to hit. Oh, you would um, love the one with Alton Brown. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. It was fantastic love Alton Brown. because he goes all into exactly what oh, the flavors are. He's and so all this smart kind of stuff, and it was really. I saw him. I saw really him live funny. a couple years ago, and he did this thing where he had the audience like. Uh, pick or there was a wheel he spun and basically created a cocktail an alcoholic cocktail well, not alcoholic well anyway he had like the all the parts of a cocktail but it ended up being just disgusting garbage but then he cryogenically f froze it and got somebody to drink it and he was just talking about the science behind food and how when you freeze something it removes the flavor and i don't know He's so smart. I love him. Yeah. So yes, I will. I will check you that one. Enjoy if you that have one any, a lot. If you have any suggestions, Gordon Ramsay's was pretty good too. Anybody, okay. anybody who does food, uh, Padma Lakshmi's was really good. She can take some heat. <gasps> I didn't even. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, we Chira, watched Selma anybody? Hayek's. She, she, she could take some heat too. Oh yeah, yeah. She was pretty. How great. are you with spicy food, Brian? I am an absolute wimp. I am just so, the worst. So if yeah. we if we did this with you and I, once we can get back in the office together, who oh. do you think should take on which role? Oh my gosh. Well, you would need to be the host. Well, actually, no, no, we both do it. We oh, both yeah, you do, do it, it right? together. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That would be a blubbering mess. I cannot take heat. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's just not my, I don't know. It's my nature. I, so I can't take bitterness. Me... Like, I hate beer. Uh, like, hoppy. Like, ugh, no, it's gross. Like, but I love sweets. I have a very sweet tooth. So maybe one day I'm we can spice. do like a toned down version of it. I mean, yeah. I mean, I did like, I did some like spicy chili challenges in college and stuff like that. And it was just awful. I was had a miserable experience, but I got a t-shirt out of it. So that was maybe the, see, that would be the great, that would be the best way for me to interview you and you not be able to come up with, mm. you know, diplomatic, you know, gray area answers. You, when you, when you, when you're, when you're melting from the mm. inside, when you're, when your face is burning, you have no yeah. choice but to say, yes, the pilot custom 74 is my favorite pen, ob you know, objectively period. That sounds like a good episode. That would be a really fun thing to do. I feel like you would get, compose yourself and ask me good questions. And, uh, I don't know if you've seen the hot ones with Will Ferrell, but he literally, I did. I did. He literally like, couldn't even form sentences. Like he had to ask like, what was the question again? Like, he's yeah, like, yeah. He's like, I did see that I'm one. I'm seeing white lights right now. He's like, yes, cause, cause, that um, would be me. Uh, that would be me. Cause, uh, Ju uh Ju Julia, Julia Louis Dreyfus was supposed to be on That's there, but right. she couldn't make it. So he was all by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. We'll have to put, we'll have to keep that in the back, on the back burner for, uh, when we get back in the office. Yeah. There's several good ones. We'll have to talk about it off channel. Nice. But yeah. It was pretty good. Cool. All right. And then finally, um, I've got some plans for this weekend, Brian, that involve empty ink bottles. Okay. I have chosen to make miniature terrariums out of hmm. an Aurora ink bottle, an Orochizuku ink bottle, a Sailor, and a Platinum ink bottle. So I've got uh, four hmm. bottles. I also got a Diamine Blue Edition bottle with the little feet on it, hmm. but I rinsed that one out, and it under the cap has these weird little white pad things that just soaked up the ink and I could not no matter how hard I try get all of the ink out of there and then and, 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 and it doesn't seal without them and I didn't want to leave it in there because it's still inky so anyway, huh. ditch that one but okay. yeah so I went online did a little bit of a deep dive on terrarium soil bought myself some terrarium soil from joshesfrogs.com um and i'm ready to go i'm gonna go on some moss hunting adventures this weekend i'm gonna use my terrarium soil maybe get some little pebbles to put down at the bottom for drainage and uh yeah gonna do that wow yes so yeah. i'm excited about that see whenever whenever i talk to people and they're like wait you sell fountain pens I love hearing example of sites like joshesfrogs.com where I'm like, okay, that's something equally as obscure and, you know, that I can point to as to like, yeah. I, yeah, he, you know. that, that website primarily uh, focuses on the, um, the rearing and, you know, habitation of poison dart frogs and stuff like that. So, uh, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not the only ones out there selling obscure things that no one needs. I mean, yeah. There you go. That that I I feel like validated. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah absolutely. So weird. All right, cool. Absolutely. No, not weird at all. <laughs> not weird at all. That's so that, awesome. that's pretty much me. So, so are you um, gonna keep? Sorry, for, forgive me. Like I think terrarium is like, it's like an aquarium, but not with aqua. There's no water. It's land things. There's plants and. But are you keeping live? animals in these like no 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 the... no just 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 plants okay are you, are uh, you a, ter a, ter a terrarium is where um you can place an animal to live if okay. you 
It's it's it is a habitat. It doesn't necessarily yeah, need yeah. to. Yeah, it's like uh, a it's like a land based. Yeah, habitat. a living a living habitat usually. Like you would. Well, have... I guess it doesn't have to be li living. It could be fake. But no, this would be. If I do it right, a living closed terrarium. So they have terrariums okay. that you like, you know, that you keep open and you water them. This one I'm trying to do a closed terrarium so that once I'm done with it, I will add some water, I will seal it, and then the water should then evaporate and fall and evaporate and fall and create a self-sustaining hmm. ecosystem. If you do it right, they can last years. Interesting. So like plants and stuff will grow in this ecosystem mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that? Very Theoretically. Fascinating. Okay, that's yep. kind of cool. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I've I've done I've done them before. Uh, they did not last for more than a couple months, though. They got moldy, so mm. my water my water was off, or I had things in there that I didn't know I had in there. That's okay. another thing. It's like unless you're really good at it, you're going to introduce elements that don't need to be in there. But oh yeah. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. So we'll see. It's a it's gonna be a fun thing to do with the extra ink bottles at the least. Fun. That sounds interesting. What about you? Um. Yeah. I. Uh, mentioned last week how I ordered some more puzzles. Oh, and I yes. got in said puzzles. I don't want, want to take up too much time or make people click off or fall asleep. So I'm like gauging how much I should get into all of them. So I thought I would just at least show a few. I won't show them all. Um, but the one that I mentioned that I think would be the most fun was a three by three that looks like a cheeseburger. I love it. So I got that for Joseph because he loves cheeseburgers. Uh, Who doesn't? And I thought it'd be really fun. So I did solve it. The thing I will say, it's actually kind of hard to solve because the pattern around it is slightly different as you mm. go around. So everything kind of looks the same, but if you don't line it up, then like the seeds that like overlap across the two cubes won't line up or the cheese oh. won't quite oh. line up. So it actually was kind of, it was harder than a normal cube because oh, man. See, I again, had to do that. You just went from something that looks like it can be fun and you describe <laughs> how it's actually not fun at all and miserable. Yeah, but it's, it looks cool when it's done. That's really why I got it was because that does look really it cool. looks like a cheeseburger. Um, yeah. Let's see here. What else did I get? I got some, I got some real weird stuff. So I'll just show you some of what it looks like. <laughs> so this one is like a triangle. Um, ah! One that, you know, it's it's four different sides. So as you turn it, the, you know, it mixes up the colors and whatnot. But what makes it even more fun is that it has this wheel, like in the middle of each side that you can turn and mix up the numbers. So you not only have to solve it for the colors, but then you have to get the numbers in the correct order too. So yeah, multiple levels to work with on that one. There's nothing enjoyable about that. Um, it gets worse. Uh, oh so I, one of my favorite puzzles of all time is the, um, it's called a Mega Minx. So it's a, it's a dodecahedral, it's 12 sided. Um, and the layers, you know, they face turn slices like this. So I have several of these. I love solving it over and over again. But what makes this one interesting is that it has these extra little pieces here in the yeah, middle. Yeah, I see those. Yeah, so that when you turn it like that, you can then mix that up but those ones oh, will stay no. in the same place oh no yeah so you can actually end up mixing it up and then you end up with different like oh, face like these little pieces here stop messing it up you're making me anxious so it's it's put it back more, put it back it's more complex than uh, your average puzzle uh, there we go no, oh, thank you. So thank you. this is most <sighs> of when I get into puzzles. Like there are new variations that come out. Like people who design these puzzles, you know, they'll do like, oh, if I take and I just take the same core base, but I slice it in a different shape, then the way to solve it is slightly different. But like the mechanics are still the same. So I know I have enough puzzles where I know like, oh, okay. So there's this aspect to it. Oh, but this other element kind of changes that up a little bit and I get to kind of figure it out, but I'm not figuring it out from scratch. So that's kind of fun. Um, this puzzle. This is called the uh, mosaic. I think it's called the mosaic cube. Clover cube, sorry, clover. So this one, you turn, you turn the 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 edges like this. Oh my god. Um, so I already have that one, but this is a double layer. So you can turn the edge, but then there's actually a separate layer here that you can also turn the edge. So, um, and then of course, as you turn more, it then mixes it up more and more in there but it gets better drew it gets no, even better no this one no. is going to really make your brain explode so not mm -hmm. only can you do that but if you actually turn it part way so i'm going to turn it just partially which sometimes it locks up a little bit so i'm going to turn it partially here 
and then if I leave it like that and then turn this part, it will then actually slice it out into a shape-shifting uh, cube. And then you can actually slice out additional layers as well, like that. So you end up with this like totally jumbled, garbled mess that you then that looks have like a to... glitch. It looks like a glitch. It looks, it looks like, like I'm a... like you. Yeah. You've just screwed with reality. Are yeah. you showing this in front of your face so people can see it, or are you holding? Up I am trying to. Okay. Yes, right. I'm trying just to. Just making sure. But yeah, so so that's this fine. One no is... one needs to see that, so you don't need to. I guess <laughs> I don't want to see it. Can you these hold it ones... off so I don't have to look at it? Yeah, these ones they get oh they get really God. challenging. I've I've solved it up to this point, and I'm I'm stuck. I'm stuck I right see, here. I... Like I, I just haven't, I, I haven't I, yet I, gotten to uh, the point where I've solved this part, but I'll get there. I just know that these things can't be solved without a lot of numbers happening, and numbers upset me. No, it's not numbers at all, Drew. It's literally it's there's no numbers. It's algorithms. It's patterns. That's the same thing. No, there's not a single. Uh, I don't use a single number when solving any of these. It's pattern recognition. Anyway, okay, uh, you ready for another one? This one's worse. No, I wasn't ready for one. This one's worse. Okay, this one's called the Andromeda cube. So yes, it's got a lot of things happening. So similar to that, it's got a different slice, but this one, the corners kind of turn, but it's a shape shifter as well. So you end up slicing out all these different corners and stuff like that. But it's a, again, it's another shape shifter. So you can kind of turn it part way and then you end up turning it like that. And then, you know, you can shape shift it further. So you just end up again with much more gobbledygook kind of going on. So yeah, fun times. All right. I like that. These, this one's painful. <laughs> this one yeah. I knew getting it. I was like, this one's going to suck. Um, but you've already solved it. Well, no, I didn't fully scramble it. But um, oh. anyway, there's that one. And then the last one that I have is probably the worst one of all of them. <laughs> so this one, um, this is Oh called, my God. This is called the multi skew dodecahedron. Stop it. So um, it's not a face turner. So it's like the same shape, right? It's a dodecahedral puzzle. You are um, going to summon some <laughs> ancient deity that is just bent on vengeance upon humanity with this yes. thing. Please don't. So this one, it slices through the puzzle. So you actually turn oh it God. through like this way. Um, but what makes it even crazier so yes you, you mix up all the corners and edges and stuff but then also as you turn it the insides also move and then as you end up turning it different ways to solve it you end up with like multiple colors sliced on the inside i literally have no idea how to solve this one so i have not yet mixed it up and uh it's also kind of clunky so it's going to be just miserable to actually physically move it but anyway I bought it just because it's ridiculously complex and it looks pretty cool. So this one is just, this one's not even fun. This is just no, plain no, torture. No, well, thank you. Thank you for at least admitting it finally. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. So if I ever I see you using that, I'm like, what did you do that you're ashamed of, Brian? Why are you punishing yourself? <laughs> like, what do you, what did you do? Uh, it's fun. Anyway. Why do you feel so guilty? Oh my God. Yeah, so that's what I do for fun in my downtime. But it does help to distract me from like other things going on in the world because it oh requires like all of my attention as I'm doing these puzzles. Because you don't suffer enough in your daily life. I don't. No, I like to oh suffer more. Ugh. Um, moving on to other things. So um, there's a show, Drew, called The Amazing Race. You've probably yeah. heard of it. It's, I've heard of it. Never it, seen it. It's on season 33. Wow. I've never seen it before either. But um, we're watching it this season. Um, whoop. Knocked out my earbuds. Okay. Um, yeah, we're watching it this season with the family. So, um, you know, uh, Kim and Penn Holderness, they are the Holderness family. They've done a whole bunch of YouTube skits and they do a lot of fun things. They are like similar life stage to me and Rachel. So they do a fun skits and we relate to them a little bit. So we heard that they were actually going to be on the show. So we were like, oh, okay, we'll check it out. But it's cool. They're like doing it in Europe and, you know, they're going to like Scotland and England and France and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, this is actually like beautiful and stuff like that. So I don't know. We're watching it. It's kind of cool. I'm not big into reality shows, but, you know, when the whole family gets into it, it's it's kind of fun. So that's been yeah. that's been interesting. Um, also did a little woodworking this weekend, kind of impromptu. Oh, yeah. nice. I always love hearing that. Yeah. I made a door threshold. Yes. So, uh, you know, my parents, they have a, a door threshold that I guess like, 
I don't know, it's really high. Like, you know, when you have sometimes have different levels of your floor. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so they have like this sunroom. It's got tile, but like, I don't know, it's got this weird threshold. So it's just like one side of it, you know, it just had too big of a gap. And they were, it was kind of like they were just tripping over it. And some friends they had over were kind of tripping over it and stuff. So I was like, you know, I really don't need my parents to be tripping over things in their own house. So they asked me to make this threshold. So I made them a door threshold that was you know, larger and more gradual and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was kind of fun. Made it out of a Is it, it was, solid... Did you do angled or rounded? I did. I angled it, but then I like rounded the corners and stuff like that. Oh, I did it out of like okay. a solid walnut and it looks really nice. I'm really happy nice. with how it turned out. I'll throw, we'll throw a picture up in here, but uh, I was really pleased with how it turned out. It was like, well, I've never made a threshold before, but it's pretty simple in its concept. So I just had a couple of measurements and I pounded it out and my parents are thrilled with it. They love it. They're nice. They're not tripping anymore. Very cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, let's see here. More outdoor adventures. Um, I have lots of logs from the various trees that I've cut down. And so I've been putting them along the edges of my trail, which I've shown you before, but basically just a whole lot more of that. So more trails, more logs out along I'm its edges. I'm going to go pull my blinds. It's getting hot. Yeah. You're like, I can see the sunlight like coming through on your thing. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, I, it's not much to show because it's basically like, oh yeah, there's more woods with a trail and logs along it, but I'm basically just doing a whole lot more of that. So yeah, that's happening. And I'll wait for Drew to put his earphones back on so I can, yeah, okay, there you go. Man, I'm really glad I shared that with you all. It was uh, probably the most hey. insightful thing that I've ever said. Oh um, man. Oh, sorry, Drew, did you not catch any of that? I missed, okay. I missed the super insightful <laughs> thing you said. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, you know, it was interesting. I had uh, what I called like a rural, a rural neighbor weekend. Um, oh, so I, I, I have an area that I need to reseed for some grass cause it's like really muddy and it's, you know, I'm just, it's that time of year, Drew, it's starting to get warmer and I'm thinking like, I'm going to start mowing again and I need to be, I need to be doing these things cause I always forget about things like grass seed and all that kind of stuff. And then it's like July and it's just a dust bowl and I'm like, oh, I need to put grass seed down, but then it doesn't rain and I don't want sprinklers or anything like that. So I'm just like, ah, okay, I need to do this in the spring. And like 10 years later, I'm like, hey, maybe I'll actually like put some seed down. Uh, but anyway, so I need to do that, but I can't, you can't just like throw seed on bare soil. So I, I bought some, some straw bales. So I like oh, literally like, took my pickup truck, went down and I bought some straw bales and I was like driving down the road with like straw coming off the back of the truck. And I'm like driving down and my neighbor's on his tractor pulling out a stump and another one's cutting oh, wow. down trees. And this, I was is your, like, this is your world. And I was like, wow, okay. I'm feeling very rural at this moment. So, I guess so. yeah. That's so what that's people always think Virginia's like. <laughs> yeah. And I had another neighbor that stopped me and asked me if I could help him weld something on his basketball hoop or whatever. Cause he heard that I weld and I was, you know, somebody else was asking me to help take care of some logs. And I was like, Oh boy, we're starting to get out in the neighborhood that I do things. Uh oh, and, see, that's uh, why my, you know. all of my hobbies are useless. <laughs> that's, that's your problem. Not useless. You, your hobbies are useful, just not useful to that many people. <laughs> I would okay, say, thank right? you. you know, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, just impractical, maybe, uh, would be the way to Fair say enough. it. Um, not useless. Uh, no, I just, you know, I've got a lot of neighbors who are, you know, uh, advanced in their in their life stages. And, you know, they're, they, they know that I'm doing stuff and I'm like, I'm really busy, but if I can help, happy to do it. So, I don't know, I'm feeling very neighborly. So, that's kind of that's kind of cool to be able to offer Good help. Good for you, helping old guys with their basketball problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. That was, that was I was like, I... I was like, I don't, uh, I have a welder. I have not welded a lot, but I will give it a try. Um, yeah. And he's not going to be like tossing around the old the, leather pumpkin. The leather pumpkin, that's right. He's not going to be hanging off doing, you know, dunking on the rim and stuff like that. So I'm like, all right, I can make it m moderately structural. Um, and uh, yeah, just mower maintenance. Went to, Went to the big box store and picked up my oil filters and my oil, and I'm gonna change the oil in my mower and get that going. I'm just like, Drew's like, I don't want any part of this, but I'm like, yeah, it's getting warmer and I know that's coming. So just gearing up for all that because all my small machines, it's like, yep, annual maintenance on all the mowers and things. I'll tell you, I, I, did, <laughs> I, did, I did a lot of that sort of stuff when I was a kid. My dad, my yeah. grandfather, like I, I did outside stuff. I got the grass. I've changed blades on lawnmowers, but I yeah. like that didn't that didn't make me like it. That made me hate it. Yeah, well, see, that's so the now thing. I don't yeah. want to do it at all ever. Yeah, I don't. 
that stuff I'm, I'm like when you when you talked about your pile of of gravel i had flashbacks about like <laughs> really my dad my dad having just like a giant pile of dirt that he had my brothers and i like just move like okay this dirt pile here yeah i need i need it over here i'm like that was like ugh, the worst <laughs> thing i'm like don't talk to me about piles of things that need to be mm. distributed or moved that's up that upsets me that triggers me no thank you yeah i will do whatever i can to avoid that fair enough Fair enough. Ugh. I have those memories too as a kid. In fact, I I first started mowing the lawn when I was seven years old with a push mower. And oh it was like God. a family affair because we had a pretty decent sized yard, but we had like four push mowers. And we God, would I all, would not, as a family, would, get out there and like push mow the lawn. I feel yeah. like my kid, my eight year old would kill himself trying to mow the lawn. I know, right? Like I wouldn't, I don't know about, I mean, I have like larger equipment and stuff. I don't have like just a little push mower. So it's like, I literally would not be safe for me to have my kids on some of the stuff that i'm using but yeah i was like yeah and that was my first run in with yellow jackets too literally first time i ever mowed the lawn i ran over a yellow oh, jacket nest and they oh. stung me all over my legs and oh my god brings back all kinds of great memories every time i run into yellow jackets as an adult mm. let me tell you which you still do <laughs> which i do on the regular but now i have a beekeeper mm. suit so i'd easier that's true i can't yeah, it's it's gonna tis, tis the season for the beekeeper suit and the uh we're getting, we, the, and the, we're getting to the point in the pencast now we're gonna be like coming up on seasonality so we're gonna be able to like yeah, reference things like brian's gonna doing. get his flamethrower out again yeah actually <laughs> actually it's about that time <laughs> light some more mulch on fire all right we should probably try to wrap this up we're at over oh, two yeah, hours okay. now fair enough fair enough okay oh gosh yeah we are going long all right yeah um, real quick though we'll we'll get into a little bit of company updates All right, well, not trying to bring too much real world stuff into this pen cast, but since we're in turkey hammock territory here, I have a feeling we'll keep it pretty light. Um, you know, the around our local area, there are some reasons to be optimistic about some COVID things. Numbers are going in a downward direction, which is encouraging to see. We're not through it all, but, um, you know, we're getting some guidance from the CDC and Virginia Department of Health and some other places. Um, it's not like a done deal. We're still waiting on stuff as it's unfolding, but we have reasons to be optimistic about good changes that are coming. And uh, yeah, that could possibly mean we could start planning for shooting together in person again, which we got to do a little bit last year and then had to reel it back. So, you know, we're not wanting to like, yeah, let's just get back together. But like, Okay, let's plan this out. So we're talking about that. So in the coming weeks uh, slash months, I don't know exact time frames, but we'll, uh, we'll be talking about that. So that's pretty exciting. And then, you know, obviously we have no idea what the future holds, but I don't know, could be, could be interesting. So yeah, we're definitely talking about that and being excited about it. Um, and then just in general in the company, we are doing our annual uh, development reviews, you know, important process. I think we mentioned this maybe last week. Mm -hmm. um, so been going through that process it's going really well. Um, so yeah, that's just taking extra time and, uh, yeah, we have a really good team. So just great time to be appreciating everybody. Even Drew, uh, even Drew, here. even Drew. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's seriously been a, been a great process and, um, yeah, lots of new products coming in. There's just, there's a lot going on, uh, internally as, as what we got, but it's a lot of good things. Like we're busy in a good way. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's mostly what's going on at, uh, Goulet Pens. So uh, now we will uh, go ahead and wrap this thing up. All right. Well, folks, y'all have been very patient with us on this one. Hopefully you've been able to wash a lot of dishes or, hey, maybe you've been able to seed your lawn or mow your lawn or something since we're getting into that season, perhaps. Um, we want to thank you for spending time with us today. Had a lot of fun. Uh, please give us some feedback uh, in the comments or email or whatever you like. Ask us some questions. Give us some recommendations for pens to look into. We do pay attention to that stuff. Uh, definitely check out gouletpens.com for your fountain pen ink and paper needs. You can email us at goulet, sorry, blah, 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 pencast at gouletpens.com. And I have some random facts, Drew, with a couple of questions for you Ooh, to put you on the on. spot. Yeah, let's round things out. Yeah. Let's end on the proverbial biscuits. Yes. So I don't know why I pulled so many facts today. But uh, anyway, as of when this is publishing, we're recording a little in advance, but as of when we're publishing, March 4th is the day that I'm looking at. And I don't know, March, it just feels like what the heck happened in January and February? We're already in March. So 
Uh, random pulled some random March 4th facts. So in 1789 on March 4th, which is 233 years ago today, the federal government under the U.S. Constitution began replacing the Articles of Confederation. So, uh, yeah, basically a very significant day for U.S. government. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a little bit of a set, mm-hmm. set 1789 in Hamilton. That's so right. 1789 always popped up in my brain. It was yeah. a thing. Uh, March 4th was also the day that Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated in 1801. Oh. He was the first president to be inaugurated in Washington, D.C. Also from Hamilton, they moved it to D.C. because... He was in the room where it happened. Am I right? Mm, That's right. And also Abraham Lincoln. Sold him down the river. That's right. And Abraham Lincoln in 1861 was also inaugurated on March 4th. So there you go. Lots of things happening. Um, It was also the first recorded case of the Spanish flu at the Funston Army Camp in Kansas starting the worldwide pandemic in 1918. Isn't that exciting? That, why, 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 why did you... It's just history, you know? It's uh, depressing, uh, but, you know, uh, it feels more relevant now than it used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tell me you have another more positive one to finish this I off. do have a couple not, positive ones. All right, all I was right, like, good, there's good, no good, way good. I'm going to end on a, all right. a, a separate global pandemic. Um, Thank okay. you. Drew, do you know what the number one movie in the box offices was? In March of 1984, since you've been in movie mode. In March. In March. Um, what was the number one movie at the box office? I do know that um, either today or yesterday was the 38th anniversary of Spinal Tap. So I know that Spinal Tap came out um, in March uh, of 1984. But I will say I don't think that was, was that number a box, one. Was that a box office hit though, or is that more probably of a cult, not? That was more. Probably of a, it feels not. like more of a cult classic that would have picked probably, up speed. Probably, probably. So I will after. not. I will not say that. Um, box okay. office. I I don't know what months things came out. Mm. So uh, I don't know. Um, let, let me let me let me go with the never ending story since you and I have talked about that and you've mentioned that it came out early in 1984. Or you said you said it was like January. Maybe it's a little early for it that. It came out a little. That one came out a little later. So I'll give you a pass on that one. Okay. Well, let me just say Beverly Hills Cop. No. Uh, all right. Was... Let's. Tr- all right. All right. Uh, Romancing the Stone. No. 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 That came out later. Uh, Terminator. No. I'll give you a big hint. There's a lot of dancing. Oh. Um. Purple Rain. Nope. Footloose. Uh. Oh, Footloose, of Footloose. course. Yep. Of course. Yep, 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 yep. Footloose. I forgot. Yep. There Footloose. you go. That All was right. number one. And in on March 4th, 1984, do you know what the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 was? I know that you will appreciate this song. Uh, was it Van Halen? Yes. What song, uh, what song was it, though? Okay, so Van Halen album 1984 came out in 1984. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, the song 1984, although it was an instrumental, so that one would not have been number one. Um, what one. else was on that album? So that was David Lee Roth. Let's go with um, Jump. Yeah. Yes. You did it. Nice. Good job, man. Might as well. There you go. Good job. Drew knows him some 1984. All right. See, I won't be able to like repeat these questions in future pencasts. That's okay. Yeah. I and this was quite enjoyable. <laughs> I thought you would like that. I thought you'd appreciate Although, it. Although, you know, I do have a hot take on Van Halen. Oh, do you? Sammy Hagar is the better singer. Oh, that is controversial, isn't better it? Better front man. Yep. Van Hagar all the way. Fight me. All right, Drew threw down the gauntlet. Please leave him your hate slash love in the comments. That's where we're ending. David Lee in. Roth is a front man. He's not a singer. Different thing. Hagar Ooh. is a vocalist. The man is objectively better so mm. which who sold more albums because that's a pretty, irrelevant that's a pretty irrelevant. objective you know quantifier in my opinion i think there were more albums with sammy so probably sammy probably yeah okay there you go drew threw down the gauntlet let me know what you think in the comments all right that's all we got for y'all this week please have a wonderful weekend slash week and we'll catch you on the next one thanks everybody and right on